Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Murder. At midnight. The sealed book. Presents. Suspense. I am the whistler. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Retro Radio. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. And in between the stories, I bring you some of the best dark, creepy, and horrifying old-time radio shows from what I've collected over the years. If you're new here, welcome to the show! While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall, and we hold these, uh, what shall we call them, meetings, adventures, seances, nightmares, usually at this time and place. So what is your terror? Are you interested in immortality? Would you like to live forever? Does the prospect of life everlasting intrigue you? Well, if it does, or even if it doesn't, stay with us. And you'll meet a gentleman who can sell you eternity. The catch? The hitch? The fine print? There isn't any. Would I lie to you? I, uh, I got all this gold. Let's make a deal. What good is gold? Gold? Gold is... Uh, uh, I notice you have some in your teeth. Is that what gold is used for? Let's make a deal. What is a deal? I'll give you half. No, I am not amused by gold. Come, you must go back. No, no. Come. I'm warning you. Okay, you ask for it. Come, Augie. Time to return. The bullet. The bullet, it, it just went through you. Put your toys away, Augie. And come back to your cage. Our mystery drama, A Cage for Augie Carroll, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Leon Janney. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The central character of our tale is Augie Carroll. That word character may be a misnomer, since Augie was never accused of having any. 
I'm afraid I must say that Augie is not a good person. As a child, he took things that belonged to others. When he grew up, he continued to practice. Of course, there was a dramatic increase in both the value of the objects and the violence of the methods. Against the wall, it's a stick-up. You punk! It is true, of course, that the wages of sin is death. But those are the final wages. The severance pay, so to speak. And the fact is, our Augie possesses quite a fortune. However, Augie is unable to enjoy his wealth at this point in time. There's a stumbling block, or I should say a cell block, for a jury of his peers has awarded Augie the status of non-paying, of involuntary guest at a leading state penitentiary for the next 99 years. However, Augie is no ordinary inmate. Even here, he's a great man. And even here, he has what is known as clout. Let us meet Augie in the exercise yard of the great prison. Hold on, Augie. Hey, Augie, you need cigarettes? Okay, okay, beat it. All of you guys. Except you, Pop. I want to talk to you, Pop. The rest of you clowns, take off. Sure, Augie. Okay. Uh, sit down, Pop. Take a load off your feet. What do you want with me, Og? You know who I am, huh? Uh, doesn't everybody know who you are? Well, how come you never come around and see me, Pop? Why Why should I do that, Augie? Come on, you're an old jail rat. Who's looking out for you, Pop? Who's uh, giving you protection? Who? Nobody. Listen, Pop. You're talking to me. Augie, Augie, I'm... I'm the oldest one in here. I, I can't do anybody good. I can't do anybody harm. I, I want nothing. Nobody wants anything from me. Pop, there's got to be organization. You know what I mean? I know, but I'm just out of it. Nobody's out of it. Everybody's got to be part of the organization. That's all. All right, Augie. Count me in. You got to pay your dues. Dues? <laughs> I don't have a cent. Come on, Pop. You get stuff from the outside. Your folks send you cigarettes, a little dough, this and that. I don't know a soul on the outside. I'm all alone in the world. All I own are the clothes on my back. You're lying, Pop. And I don't even own those. Those belong to the state. My boys can make it rough. Augie, I'm going to die soon. I'm so tired, you, you'd be doing me a favor. Okay, okay, but the joint's got to be organized. Y you got to give me something. Like they say, uh, a token, a good face, you know? <laughs> yeah, I know. Come to think of it, I do have something. Yeah, now you're talking. Tell me, Augie, what do you want more than anything else in the world? Are you nuts? Tell me. I want to bust out of here. No. No, you just say that. Because that's what every con is supposed to say. But you really don't want to break out. Yeah, how do you know? Because if you wanted to escape, you'd do it. Huh? You've done it before, but you don't want to. And I know why. Yeah? Why? You're a dead man on the outside, Augie. That's what 99 years means. You have no friends now. They all want you for the gold. What gold? The gold you stole on your last job. The gold you got hidden away. Everybody knows about it. Cops, crooks, they all hunt you down for the gold. You stay here because it's the only place you're safe. Anybody ever tell you you talk too much, Pop? But even here, how long can you be safe? You're scared stiff. Some mobsters will come in and... Bust you out. You better shut up. I can give you the one thing money can't buy. Yeah. What? What you need. A hideout. A hideout? That's right. A place where you'll be absolutely safe and secure and comfortable. Where is it? Where? Huh. Well, that's, that's hard to say. Come on, where is it? Right now, it's in my cell. What are you talking about? What are you talking about, Pop? You'll see. I'll bring it here tomorrow afternoon. Bring what? 
your hideout. How can you bring it? Okay, there's no more talking. Button up and that means everybody. Okay. All right, you got ten minutes. You can sit down. You can smoke. Hey, Pop. Hey, Pop. You come on over here. Oh, good afternoon, Hoggy. Yeah, well, what was her? What was that line you was handing me yesterday? Well, I I promised you a hideout. Huh? I have it here with me. In this little bottle. See? This little white powder. Pop, you know, you're crazy. And you have enough of this powder to last through eternity. Almost. You've been in stir so long, you finally blew your lid. You have no idea how long I've been in stir, Augie. Add it up. Here and there, each time, each each lifetime, I'd say about 950 years. What? I think that's some kind of record. Listen, Pop, just beat it, huh? Why don't you believe me? A guy says he's done 950 years in jail, and he wants to know why I don't believe him all. This powder, Augie, you take several grains of this powder... Oh, yeah, yeah. ...and your body will... Well, it, it, it goes into a, a state of suspended animation. That's the modern term. She called it a trance. She? She? Who are you talking about? Yes, it's at least 2,600 years ago. But I'll never forget her. Oh, for crying out loud. I never knew her name. She was a priestess in the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. And she fell in love with me. Hey, Pop, Pop, you, you know the sun's getting hot out here. Maybe you ought to get in. Anyhow, you, you swallow a few grains and you go into a deep trance. And when you come to or wake up, it's hundreds of years later. And it's a new world, a new society. Nobody knows you. Nobody wants you. You start life all over. Oh, rave on. Now, now make plans to break out, Augie. Quickly before they come for you. Go get your gold. Sure, get the gold. And then where do I hide? Oh, you crazy old nuts. You promised me a hideout. You haven't been listening, Augie. You can hide anywhere. A secluded spot, a a cave, a forest, a a desert. Yeah, great. And what do I do for chow? I'm trying to explain this, Augie. You don't eat. You don't drink. You don't have any wants. You, You have no needs. You're oblivious to cold, to heat, to rain, to, to snow. And in several hundred years, you come alive again. But how can you go... Augie, for... don't question. What do you mean, don't eat? Well, ancients, they lived close to the gods. All the gods. Those were the days of marvels and miracles and wonders. Today, we don't believe anymore. So we use science to try to duplicate what the gods... Never mind all that. Just tell me, Pop. If this is such a hard item, how come you ain't using it, huh? Oh, I have. Yeah? Many times. Well, I was a galley slave in Greece. A gladiator in Rome. I was in the Tower of London. The Bastille. No matter how I tried, no matter how many times I started fresh, I always wound up in prison. Well, wouldn't you have enough brains to, to learn? No, Augie. And you won't have enough brains either. Once a jailbird, always a jailbird. Oh, I'm sick of it. I I haven't been able to stay out of jail for over 2,500 years. Huh? All I want to do now is, is die. Guys like you and me, Augie, we never learn. Okay, break it up. Fall in. Augie. Let's go. Remember... I'm not a nut. Uh, Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. When your time comes, just go somewhere. Take a few grains of that powder. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Guard that powder with your life, Augie. Uh, It's your ace in the hole. Well, good morning, Augie. Uh, I hope you slept well. Uh, What do you want? 
Figure that cell all cleaned up. All right, all right. There's a new guard taking over my post. So? I'll be on the rear gate. None of you guys is a bargain. Oh, you'll miss me, Augie. The new guy reported in this morning. His name's Castle. He thinks he's tough. What else you got in your mind? Oh, I think you were a friend of Pop. Who said I was? He died last night. Yeah? Was that all you can say? Yeah? He left you his fortune. What fortune? Here it is. Come on, take it. Hey, what's this? Eh, I don't know. I asked the warden's kid. You know the smart one that goes to high school? He says it's an ancient Greek coin from, uh, I don't know, what's the name of that place? Uh, that, Delphi, something like that. <laughs> Tell me, Augie, how does it feel to inherit a fortune? <laughs> You punks think this is a town hall meeting? Start walking. So, uh, not you. You're Augie Carroll, huh? And you're the new screw, huh? A little tap across the gut. I also got one that'll knock your teeth out. Yeah, you figure you're pretty good with that club, huh? Well, you could find out the hard way. Figure you're tough, don't you, Castle? Mr. Castle to you, punk. Uh, See, what do you want? This is a penitentiary. So? You know what that means. It's a place where you do penance. Have you been doing any penance, Augie? Okay, Castle, what's your game? I want you to call me Mr. Castle. Yeah, what else you want? I want you to think about your sins, Augie. <laughs> think about them and repent. <laughs> okay, you got ten minutes. Sit down, smoke. He was wrong, wasn't he, Augie? Oh, the man that wrote stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. You know better than that, don't you, Augie? What's on your mind, Castle? Oh, must have been one of those slow learners in school. Oh, I guess these days they call him underachiever. Why do you want? I want you to call me Mr. Castle. Yeah, well, what's on your mind, Mr. Castle? You're on my mind, Augie, night and day. Yeah. Why? Let's let's go talk to the warden about it. Hey, hey, wait, wait. What, what are you charging me with? I'll think of something. Hey, all you guys. You guys. You're your witnesses. I'm being framed. Hey, uh, hey, Shut up, punks. Now, Mr. Augie Carroll, start walking. Officer Castle and one prisoner headed for the warden's office. Walk through, Augie. Quick, Augie, dug in here. What? Do as I tell you. What's the big idea? Shut up. We'll head this way. This ain't the way to Warden's office. What do you care? You don't want to go there anyhow. That's where we headed. Out. Out. Out where there's booze and girls and two-inch steaks. What are you talking about? We're headed for the rear gate. Hey, wait a minute. Right now, there's only one guard. Hold it. You mean you don't want to go? Why am I getting into Castle? My name isn't Castle. Why you mean your name isn't Castle? And I'm not a prison guard either. You ain't a... Hey. Well, who? What are you? That's a pretty good question. You must admit, so far, our tale is replete with people who are not what they seem. For instance, old-timer convict Pop claimed to be a Greek galley slave. And here we have prison guard Castle suddenly disavowing his identity. Well, at least you can depend on me to come back shortly with Act Two. Well, you know what's been happening to Augie Carroll a hoodlum presently resident in one of our state institutions. First, an old and apparently half-insane convict gives him a vial containing a powder which can put a man to sleep for several centuries, or so he claims. Now, Augie is being conducted to the rear gate of the prison by a guard who has just revealed he isn't a guard at all, but someone who is going to help Augie escape. Even a mental genius would have trouble grasping at the significance of all these events. It's no wonder, then, that Augie insists on stopping short to think things out. Well, well, what do you mean, you, you ain't a real guard? That's it, Augie. 
How'd you get that uniform? How'd you get in here? It's a long story, but right now we only have time for a short one. Well, start talking. Let's talk about a hundred little blocks of pure gold. Each block weighs exactly one pound. So? So you freelance that one, Augie, and the big guy wants his piece. My deal with him was I could operate on my own, too. I don't owe him nothing, but this was his idea, Augie, to spring you. It's worth a piece, isn't it? What's he want? Fifty percent. No dice. Okay, Augie, stay here. Keep a hundred percent of nothing. What's the matter? Lose your nerve? You afraid to bust out? I ain't afraid of nothing. Well, do we go or do we stand here in the corridor much longer? Okay. Okay, we go. Start walking. How'd you get in here? You know the big guy. He has friends everywhere. He can find out if some guy's being transferred like a prison guard. There was a guard named Castle. He was coming here from way downstate. Well, he never made it. How do we get out the rear gate? Just up ahead, the door. It's open. Walk out. <laughs> now turn left. A rake is leaning against the wall. Pick it up. Start raking leaves. You follow this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Work your way slowly, very slowly toward the gate. I'll be talking to the guard. I'll hold his attention. Get behind him. Cloud him. Here, take this blackjack and make sure of him. What's the matter? I don't know how to stop a guy. Best if it's clean and we don't have to shoot. Now, here's the door. Walk out. Slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, well. Look at who made the cleanup detail. Big Augie himself. Yeah. We're going to show this punk how the other half lives. Get working on those leaves before I start working on you. You know, Castle, I've been watching you. Oh, have you? Yeah. You're going about this job dead wrong. Am I? You can't treat these men like animals. Why not? That's exactly what they are. Now, you're brand new on the job, Castle. Now, let me give you a few tips. You think you know all the answers, huh? I don't know any of the answers. But I do know that for eight hours a day, we're just as much in jail as they are. So, why not just try to live together? Now, give a guy a break and... And never, never do what we're doing now. What's that? Never let a con get behind you. Hey! Hey, let's just plug him! Uh, 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 rear gate! Uh, rear gate! Uh, uh, run rear for it, Ted. Yeah. Rear gate! There's the car. Get in the back. Hey. Hey, what's this? A uh, dame behind the wheel? Jump in and shut up. Get out of here, Jenny, fast. That box on the back seat. Slack, sports shirt, change. Pass me a shirt and pants. Who's this dame? We need a real person, don't we? I never heard of a dame who could... Woman's lip, Augie. A fantastic thing. Now, you always thought dames were only for having laughs with. <laughs> There's a million other great services they can perform. Ginny, stop the car. Augie, your jailbird suit and my uniform. Toss them behind those bushes out of sight. Yeah, that's it. Okay, good deal. Okay, get going, Ginny. Wait a second. Head back toward the jail. What's the matter, Augie? Changed your mind? Busting out of jails is something I know more about than anybody in the country. In two minutes, you'll have cars, motorcycles, helicopters heading this way after us. But who's going to bother with a car that's kind of loafing along toward the jail? So we pass the jailhouse, pick up the pike, and head south instead of north. Move out and go slow. Slow, you understand? She understands. And why don't she say so? What can I tell you? She just isn't a talker, that's all. <laughs> Looks like we lost everybody. So, now let's head for the gold. The gold, huh? That was the deal. We spring you, you get those little blocks of gold, and we split 50-50. We, the big guy, and you. And, uh, you and her... What do you get? Jenny and I are on the big guy's payroll. We get a salary every week. Is that so, Jenny? Yeah, she really don't talk, does she? Well, she's a very serious person. Very deep. She can't be bothered with trivia. Yeah? What does she talk about? Uh, it depends. On what? On whatever suits her mood at the moment. I don't like a dame that never opens her mouth. Uh, it may very well be, but... Uh... The fact is, you don't have to like her, Augie. Sort of business. Let's head for the gold. Now? Augie, yesterday is dead. Tomorrow may never be born. All we can rest on and swear by is today. Okay, okay. 
Keep heading south. You heard the gentleman, Jenny. Yeah, how about if we stop for some chow, huh? Well, you can't risk being seen, Augie. We gotta eat. Oh, I guess. Jenny, that's a diner up ahead. Pull into the parking lot. I'll go in and pick up some food. Uh, Augie, you try to keep out of sight. This ain't the first time I've been on the land. <sighs> Augie? Huh? Well, what do you know? She talks. Listen, what gives with a dame like you? Never mind all that. I don't have much time. You don't have much time either. Yeah, why? He's going to cross the big guy. He is? Yeah, he wants all the gold for himself. He does? Well, where do you come in? The two of us. We're together. So what does he want to do? You take us to where it's hidden. He shoots you. We take the gold and leave the country. So? Why is that a bad idea? Oh, it's a great idea. It's got one thing wrong with it. It can't work. Why not? You know why not. You don't cross the big guy. Because if you do, there's no place in all the world you can hide from him. Now, what does Castle, or whatever his name, say to that? Oh, he laughs. He figures he's pretty smart. Well, he went to college. Okay, okay. Well, what do you tell me all this for, huh? Because I don't want no part of it. I... I want to get in wrong with the big guy. That's good thinking. It, it's not like I didn't try to talk him out of it, but... I don't know, sometimes a guy just won't listen to reason. Yeah, I know. So, well, there's something he don't have to know. Yeah? What? You don't have to know that I'm giving you this little thirty-two revolver. Take it. Sure. Sure, thanks. Now, remember, you're safe till we get to the gold... And then... Look, you don't have to tell me what to do. You know, it's really a shame. He's so educated. He speaks so nice. Now, why would you ask a question like that, Augie? I mean, you mean... Well, why would a, a mug like me want to know about stuff like... Uh, like trances. Yeah, that's right. Uh, ancient Greeks and Romans. Well, I, uh, I've done a lot of reading in jail. Ah, you know, you could read. Ah, uh, you're so smart. But you're just a hood yourself. Why ain't you teaching college? There's not enough money in it. Yeah. So, so what about them ancient Greeks? Huh? Well, there were legends, stories of magic, miracle healing, trances. The ancients knew many secrets. But all knowledge of them has disappeared. Maybe we're rediscovering those secrets through science. Yeah. Yeah, that's what he said. Maybe what the gods reveal to the priests in the ancient temples, they, uh, they now reveal to the scientists in laboratories. Hey, slow down, Jenny. Up ahead, uh, is that the country road where we're supposed to turn off? Yeah, it looks like it. Go ahead, Jenny. It's a bad road to travel at night. Yeah, yeah, but uh, it's like a rainbow, you know what I mean? There's a pot of gold at the end of it. You said there was a, a hut just off to the right. Yeah, yeah. Stop the car, Jenny. Maybe we passed it. <laughs> I, I, I don't see anything. You don't? Why don't you turn around and look? Hey, what the... I never like to shoot a guy in the back. Where'd you get that gun? Wait. Ginny. Ginny. This is one of them times she got nothing to say. Listen, Augie. Now, now, listen. Maybe we could discuss... Sure, what... sure. But me, I always discuss things best with this. No. Well, that's one down, Ginny. What do you mean, one down? One down, one to go. But I... I saved your life. So I say thanks. Oh, but you can't. You can't kill I me. I can't. Why? Because you can't. You can't double cross a big guy. Who says? You can't double cross the organization. They'll hunt you down. They'll never find me. You can't hide. I got a place. Augie. Augie, look at me. Look, I, I'm not so bad to look at, am I? No, no, you're great. Oh. Then take me with you, huh? You wouldn't want to go with me, babe. I would. I would. I'll be gone a long time. I don't care. Want me to tell you how long I'll be gone? I said I didn't care. I'm going to be gone for three, four, maybe five hundred years. But I don't... What, what are you saying? 
saying, Archie? I'm saying I'll be away maybe 500 years. You're, you're crazy. That's how it goes, Jenny. I gotta say goodbye now. Don't show me. Well, the die, as they say, is cast. Augie has reached and decided to cross his Rubicon. The vial of white powder is in his pocket. Now to pick up the gold, find some remote spot, and sleep, the chance to dream, for uh, three, four, five hundred years. We'll see how this all works out when I return shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago, News Radio 78. In Chicago, the time, 11.05, 63 degrees officially in Chicago now, 64 at the Lubin Lakefront. Now back to the Mystery Theater. And now Augie has more trouble than any one person can handle. An escaped convict, he is urgently wanted and pursued by the law. Since he has a suitcase containing 100 pounds of pure gold, he is being avidly sought by the underworld. He also has a vial of white powder, the contents of which can enable him to go into a death-like trance for several hundred years, or so he has been told. But can he believe such a thing? And does he have an alternative? That white powder could be the answer. But uh, what if it's a phony? Suppose it's a poison. These are the thoughts that spin about in Augie's head as he drives along the road to, uh, well, so far, to nowhere. We interrupt to bring you this latest bulletin. Killer Augie Carroll, who escaped from the penitentiary yesterday, is still at large. However, a spokesman for the authorities is confident that Augie will be captured. As the spokesman said, too many people want this guy. He'll turn up in a day or two, dead or alive. Yeah. And I can also turn up in three, four hundred years, too. And how do I know Pop was on the level? Can I just take that powder and go out like a light? And come back just like that? Yeah, and if I can, what will it be like all the years from now? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe I can find a hideout. There's got to be somebody I can trust. Somebody. Not everybody's a rat, Jerry. Jerry, sure. Sure, Jerry. Corgi. Let me in quick. Why, sure. I need a place to cool out. Well, sure, Augie. Only if... Only what? Well, only the cops will be sure to check here. So what? You're clean. You are clean, ain't you? Sure. So they got to take your word. You ain't seen me. Now, first thing I got to do is hit the sack. Just go in the bedroom. Uh, oh, let me take that suitcase. Yeah. It looks heavy. Hey, keep your hands off it. Okay. Sleep as long as you like. And there's, uh, there's plenty of heat in the refrigerator. I... I'll see you later. Yeah, where are you going? I, uh, I'm working tonight. The band's still playing at the Silver Slipper? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. We're in solid. Who got you the job? You did. And who staked you all their music lessons? You did. I just want you to remember what you said a long time ago. You said you'd never forget it. I haven't. Okay, beat it. I want to sleep. Uh, sure, Augie. Uh, I'll see you. Hey, Jerry? Yeah? Come here. Well, what is it, Augie? Hey, tell me, Jerry, what's this card? Card? I just seen it on the table. Oh. On the phone. Oh, oh, that card. Yeah, yeah, it says, uh, City Police Force Special Investigations. Sergeant Morton, private number 2278308. Uh, well, let's, uh... Guess what? Uh, well, the cops were here, Augie. Yeah? Well, you know, they'd be sure to come here. Yeah. And this cop, this uh, Sergeant Morton, he said to me, have you seen Augie? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, well, if uh, <clears throat> if you hear any news at all about Augie, just call us at this number. He left the card. And and, and, and were you going to call him if I showed up? Augie, how could you even ask me such a question? Were you, Jerry? Never, Augie, never. And why did you keep the card? Well, uh, <sighs> You know how it is, I just... Why did you keep the card, Jerry? Well, you know, 
Look, the guy, he, j he just left if it. If you wasn't going to use it, why did you keep it? Augie, Right I... here, right next to the phone. Andy. Augie, will you listen? And all you got to do while I'm fast asleep is make one little phone call. The cops get me, and you get all gold in the suitcase. Right, Jerry? Augie, please. You shouldn't have kept the cards. Oh, Augie, oh, Augie, you've got to listen to me. You, you, you don't believe that I'd ever call the cops? Oh, I know that you never call the cops, Jerry. Augie, don't. Please, you can't. You can't. <sighs> you can't even trust your own brother. What a world. <laughs> Escaped convict, Augie Carroll, has been traced to Mountain City. He is armed, he is dangerous, he is vicious. Spokesmen for the authorities are confident his recapture is a matter of hours. Ah, shut up. <sighs> well, maybe... Maybe I better hole up someplace and take that powder. Ah, but that's it's crazy. It's gotta be crazy. Pop had to be crazy. How can you just take a... Wait. Wait a second. Maybe... Maybe I could get a deal on a big guy. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's me, Augie. Yeah. Never mind where I'm at. Now, just tell me. What kind of deal can we make? Oh, you mean 75%? Castle, or whoever he was, said 50. Yeah? Yeah, come over just like that, huh? And how do I know I don't get bumped off the minute I walk in, huh? Tell me. How do I know? <sighs> what am I gonna do now? What? <laughs> Here. Here. Yeah, yeah, right here. Right by these rocks. Yeah, nobody. Nobody could ever find me here. Hey, hey. All I got to do is take this powder. You know, I, I, I wake up, it's hundreds of years from now, and I got the gold, and I can start all over, and, and I got it made. I just take the powder. And hey, it looks like I... Took a powder into the future. <laughs> well, here goes. Yeah, no, yeah, don't touch too bad. I better try some more. I want to be gone a good long time. years later, the car should be a heap of rust. But I ain't. And my clothes, they should be rotted away. But they're still brand new. Well, 
Because of the powers of phony. Oh. How could such a crazy thing work? Yeah, I can stay here and die. Or I can go back to jail. Augie? Huh? Augie? What? Augie, give me a lift back, please. You? Well, you're, you're, you're Jimmy. Yes. Well, you, you can't be Jimmy. I... I killed you. I, I I killed you. Yes. You killed me. You're dead. Oh, I've been dead for... It must be 800 years. 800 years? You took a lot of that powder, Augie. Well, if... If you're dead 800 years, where, 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 where'd you come from? I've come from out of your head, Augie. Huh? They found me inside your head. They? Yeah. Well, who, who, who's they? They? The schoolmistress and her people. They found me in Castle and Pop and Jerry and the jail and the gold. They looked inside your head, Augie, and they found it all. No, 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 no. You ain't my head. You're real. I didn't kill you. You did, Augie. You did. I must have missed. Well, I won't miss this time. Don't shoot me, Augie. This time I'll make sure of you. You'll only foul up my circuits, and I'll have to go to the repair shop, and the mistress will be angry. This time. Augie, we're due back at the jail for another performance, dog. Oh, Augie. Why did you do that, you never... What the... Huh. Well, you, you, you ain't real. You're nothing but a... But a doll. You ain't real. Augie. Huh. Well, who are you? You know very well who I am. I am the schoolmistress, Helena. Yeah? And you must come back to the cage. Where am I? I realize you're a member of a lower order of life with an undeveloped mentality. But still you could try to learn. But I don't understand. I don't know. You are the only remnant of a primitive race that once inhabited this planet. What are you talking about? Whether you kill yourselves off by war or disease or some other stupidity... Hey, listen. ...or whether all of you simply left this planet, taking all your records with you, we shall never know. But you are the sole survivor. In your head, we can read the only clues to your race that remain. This ain't happening. It... it can't be heaven. You had two classes of people as we reconstruct your thoughts. Those in prison and those outside. Look, 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 it's a gag, huh? Tell me it's a gag. Those in prison always try to escape. Those outside always tried to bring them back. That was the business of your society. But I ain't done nothing to you. And so, you must go back to prison. But why? You must go back. So that you may escape again. But if I'm going to escape, why do I you have You will to... spend what remains of your life escaping and being recaptured. Why, why, why? So that our children may study you and examine the workings of a lower order of hey, life. Hey, hey, I got all this gold. Let's make a deal. Gold? We notice you have some in your teeth. Is that what it was used for? And why do you carry such a huge extra supply? Come, Augie, it's late. I'll give you half. You will go back to prison. Pop will give you the powder. Castle will help you escape. You will kill Castle, Ginny, and Jerry. Once again, you will wake up here. And you will go back to prison again and again and again. <laughs> As they say, there is no armor against fate. Poor Augie. Condemned to eternal escape and recapture. But isn't that everyone's fate? Don't we strive to escape our faults? And aren't we constantly being recaptured 
by our weaknesses? Let me recapture you in just a few moments. And so, Augie Carroll. Can you imagine? Augie turned out to be the sole survivor of the human race and the only repository of our accumulated culture and wisdom. And it was from Augie that another race received its entire concept of our civilization. A bum rap for mankind, you say? Well, suppose you were the only survivor. What could be learned from you? From me, you can learn that we'll be here again with another mystery. Our cast included Leon Janney, E.V. Juster, Robert Maxwell, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. Artie, you sounded just like Handsome Harry. I am Handsome Harry, sweetheart. Just using Stupid's body for a while. You... You are using Artie's body? Until I learn how to materialize, if I ever do. They tell me on the other side, in that limbo joint, it takes a lot of patience and practice. Yeah, what do they know? They even told me I'm getting this hate out of my soul the wrong way. Well, I haven't wanted to say anything. All right, so uh... don't. They say taking out my hate on Tex and Dory... Make my hate grow bigger. Said I gotta find forgiveness in my heart. I told him to take a part. I know what I'm doing. I hope so. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, Jot down ideas for that novel you want to write. Use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness Journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Several legends of giant white men exist throughout Native American culture, including the northern tribe of Comanche and southern Mantenos. In the book History of the Choctaw Indians, Chickasaw and Natchez, published in 1899, Horatio Bardwell Cushman writes, 
The tradition of the Choctaw that has long been a race of giants inhabited what is now the state of Tennessee, beings with which their ancestors fought when migrated from the West. Its tradition states that Nahulo had an impressive stature. The Nahulo, according to Cushman, was a common term for white settlers within the United States, but its original derivation was referring to white giants. Ray Vibrante Comanche was the reigning leader of Great Plains tribes who referred to white men reaching heights of three meters It had a more dominant role in culture than even the current Caucasian or former white settler prevalence. They had many forts that dominated the landscape. Coincidentally, they would be eliminated by a much larger force, such as the Great Spirit, and Ray Vibrante dictated they actually were responsible for the societal mounds within North America. Much of this history was written down by Dr. Donald Panther Yates, a Native American historian, as follows. A majestic white race endowed mining technology giants that dominated Western North America, enslaving inferior tribes. They died or returned to heaven. In the South, Aztec myths said that the human race was developed during the Sun of Rain per the legend of the suns by the god Tlaloc, although other creation myths exist. According to this myth, the sun showed during the third cosmogonic epoch of Quetzalcoatl. The people of Teotihuacan and Tlachialotlpetl originated from the feathered serpent in Cholula, and this battle lasted until the times of the conquistadors. Pedro de Leon wrote in 1864, There are reports concerning giants in Peru who have arrived at the coast at the point of Santa Elena. The natives were dismayed to see a boat made of reeds reaching its shore with cargo of creatures so high that knee to the floor was as big as a man of great stature. His limbs were deformed in proportion to the size of their bodies, and their heads were something monstrous to do with hair hanging to his shoulders. His eyes were as large as small plates. Apparently the giants were not shy about public sexuality, and it shamed the natives, and is the explanation for their elimination from the earth by deities. The Nevada tribe, Paiuti, also describes white settlers brought by a red-headed giant who survived on the blood of their own. According to oral history recorded by Sarah Winnemucca Hopkins, the Paiute defeated the Saiteka in an epic battle. Some cave findings in the area corroborate this narrative. Bones in private collections show odd features that suggest cannibalism, as well as oversized artifacts like 40-centimeter sandals. Depictions of the mysterious giant Piazza bird can be found on a limestone bluff overlooking the Mississippi. Native American legend tells this creature existed long before the Pale Faces arrived on their lands. It was a bird described as one that devours men in the Illini tongue. An interesting theory suggests the Piazza bird may be related to ancient Japanese dragons. The first discovery of the Piazza bird was reported in 1673 when French-Canadian explorers Father Jacques Barquette and Louis Joliet sighted a painting of the creature as they navigated the river near present-day Alton, Illinois. As we were descending the river, Marquette recorded later in his diary, we saw high rocks with hideous monsters painted on them and upon which the bravest Indian dare not look. They are as large as a calf with heads and horns like a goat their eyes are red, beard like a tiger's, and face like a man's. Their tails are so long that they pass over their bodies, ending like a fish's tail. They are painted red, green, and black, and so well drawn that I could not believe they were drawn by the Indians, and for what purpose they were drawn seems to me a mystery. Measuring some 30 feet long to 12 feet high, the depictions of the Piazza bird are the largest pictoglyphs ever documented in Aboriginal America. The carvings were made on the sheer face of the cliff. Native Americans said the cliff was so steep no man could climb up to it. If Native Americans did not make the carving in the Piazza bird then, who did? The Illini Indians, near what is now Alton, Illinois, were terrified of the bird and fired arrows and bullets whenever they passed the painting. 
Researchers who spoke to Illini Indians learned that the Piazza bird existed in this country many thousands of moons before the arrival of the Pale Faces. Indians from Miami said something similar. According to them, the Piazza bird was present in America several thousand winters before the Pale Faces came. The Native American dragon came to the country a very long time ago. The Illini Indians say the giant bird killed not only their animals but also people, and they drove it away in prehistoric times. In the 19th century, explorers reportedly found a nearby cave filled with human bones and sightings persist in the area of a giant bird. Nobuhiro Yoshida, professor of languages and president of the Japan Petrograph Society, compared the paintings of the Piazza bird with depictions of ancient Japanese dragons and found some striking similarities. According to Professor Yoshida, the Piazza bird resembles the dragon depicted by Siko Kano in the painting for the ceiling of the Hashirai Shrine at Yukahashi Fukuoka Prefecture. Both the American Piazza and the Japanese dragon have talons, are winged, bearded, horned, and are multicolored. This may naturally be a pure coincidence, but it is an interesting observation. However, unlike the murderous Piazza bird, dragons were the objects of Japanese prayers and rituals because the creatures were personifications of drought-ending thunderstorms. We encounter dragons and dragon kings in almost every ancient culture of the world. Dragons played an important role in the beliefs of our ancestors, and these creatures were depicted in a variety of ways and are regarded as either good or fearsome evil creatures. Up next, it's the Native American legend of the Little Deer when Weird Darkness Returns. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. Mystery House, that strange publishing firm owned by Dan and Barbara Glenn, where each new novel is acted out by the Mystery House staff before it is accepted for publication. Mystery House. I understand I'm going to be doing a very sinister character in tonight's Mystery House story, Barbie. You can say that again. Gives me the creeps. Mm, complete with quartet, huh? That's the title. What does it mean? Why, haven't you ever seen advertisements for funeral homes in which the copy listed a price for funeral services, complete with quartet? Oh. Uh, speaking of advertisements... Ah, uh, which is precisely what you're always doing, Tom. Right, Mr. Glenn. And here's a message from our sponsor. Okay, places, everybody. Set the scene, Tom. Complete with quartet. The scene opens in the reception room of the Renfron Funeral Home. Mr. Renfron, a polished, suave gentleman, has just come in and is greeting the nightman Harry Canby, who doesn't look too wide awake. Well, did I wake you up, perhaps, Harry? Huh? Oh, uh, no, 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 boss. I've been awake all the time. You know, some night I will stay on the night shift 
just to see whether it's possible for you to look any more wide awake in the small hours of blackness than you do in the morning. Any uh, business, Harry? Uh, Joe Graben brought in one of his boys, got hit with an automobile. Hit with an automobile? Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. Any uh, bullet wounds we must take care of on the corpse? No, this guy was really hit by a car. Straight goods, he says. Straight goods. That would be a refreshing novelty. I suppose uh, Joe wanted the special funeral? Uh, the works, he says, even including the quartet. Hmm. An excellent customer, Mr. Graben. I wish we had a few more like him buying in, uh, in quantity. The body is in the receiving room? Sure. You told me never to monkey with any of Graben's stiffs. Yes, I know. They sometimes require the delicate craftsmanship of a master. Well, let's take a look at this one. It's all right for me to go back with you. Uh, Betty ain't here to take over the switchboard yet. Hmm. She is a little too late too often. Oh, well, I doubt that Joe Graben's working this early in the morning. There will be no calls. Come along. In the receiving room, you said? Yes? Yeah. This uh, mangled one over against the wall? I, uh, uh, yeah, 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 that's the one, uh, but... But, uh, the other one. You said nothing about... There wasn't any other one, boss. Honest, just the one. This man on the table in the middle of the room. Who is he? Oh, i never seen him before in my life, boss. Honest, I... Shut up. Stand back. Hmm. He's been shot through the heart. Murdered, huh? No, no, no. He was probably playing with a cap pistol and it went off accidentally. You blundering idiot. Who brought this body in here? Nobody, boss. Well, from the extremely dead look of the gentleman... It's rather obvious that he did not walk in here alone. Somebody brought that body in here last night. You and I, we have to own the keys. I don't know a thing about it. I should have known better than to have a stupid, blundering idiot like you on night duty here. What am I going to do with this body? Maybe somebody will come in and claim it. You maybe... Don't tax my patience, Harry. Are people in the habit of claiming the bodies of murder victims? Would anyone admit bringing it in? No, maybe not at that. Harry... I think we're going to have a very private funeral. Huh? Somebody has entrusted this body to us for burial. Somebody who appreciates our skill and tact. Fortunately, we have another body. Oh, I'll get you, boss. A grave will have to be prepared for the other body. The funeral for Joe Graben's boy will not be until tomorrow. Tonight, we bury the stranger beneath the grave that Joe Graben's late friend will occupy tomorrow. Well, what good will that do? You mean saving the price of a cemetery lot? You moron. I mean that nobody would ever think of looking for a murdered man's body in the graveyard, particularly if the body is beneath another coffin. When they find one coffin in the grave, they look no further. You see, it's very simple. Yeah. Meanwhile, I have a little work to do, Harry. Uh, you mean fixing up Joe Graben's boy? No, that is a routine matter. Even you could handle it. No, no. I have a much bigger job. What? Determining who gets the bill for the most profitable funeral that we have ever conducted. Huh? Somebody who knows about the work I do for Joe Graben has selected me for the disposal of a body. I have been chosen as a goat. And somebody's going to pay very dearly for that choice, Harry. I'm going to play detective. I told the boy at the desk to tell you I wouldn't see you. I don't know you. Carl Renfron is the name. Perhaps you've heard of the Renfron Funeral Home, one of the finest in this part of the country. Beautiful chapel, pipe organ, and a special quartet for the deluxe service. What is this, a gag? If it is, it isn't very funny. My business is never very funny, Miss Dare. What do you want of me? You sing in one of Joe Graben's nightclubs, yes? Sure. What of it? I suppose you read in the paper this morning about the disappearance of a handsome young detective. I don't read the papers. Get out of here. His name was Peter Harley, and he was working on a shake-up of the local underworld. How should I know anything about him? You had a date with him last night, after your last show. How do you know? That is neither here nor there. You were the last person to see him alive, as far as the police know. The cops? 
They know I had a date with him? Not yet. They won't know until I tell them. But you said you didn't want to cooperate with me. And so I'll have to tell them, of course. What do you want? Did you kill Peter Harley, Miss Dare? Did I? Hey, what is this anyway? He ain't dead. Huh. I would make a substantial wager on that. But you don't think I killed him? I had a date with the guy. If you will pardon my saying so, that hardly eliminates you as a murder suspect. Don't tell me you were madly in love with him. Your kind doesn't fall in love with anything except cash. I... I don't know whether I ought to tell you what it was all about or not. Then perhaps I'd better go to the police. No, no, I... I I'll tell you. That's better. He, uh... He wanted to get some dope on Joe Graben. Said he'd give me a hundred bucks for what I could tell him. I didn't plan on really telling him anything. You were interested in the hundred dollars. Sure, that's all. Why did you kill him, Miss Dare? I didn't kill him. If anybody killed him... Yes? Nothing. You make it very difficult for me, Miss Dare. The police... Okay. If anybody killed him, it was that new piano player at the club. You seem quite positive. Well, Harley didn't give me the hundred bucks. Said I was holding out on him. That if I wasn't careful, he'd have me thrown in the clink, the louse. He said, if there's any tip off on me, you get it, Marie. Yes? That doesn't seem to prove anything about the piano. Well, no, he'd been sauntering over to the piano and talking to her all evening. And he had a date with me. She's new in the joint. What's her name? Where can I find her? Her name's Betty Lanning. What? Repeat that, please. Betty Lanning. Why? You want her address? No. I think I can find her without too much trouble. But what makes you think this Betty Lanning had something to do with his death? He left me here at my hotel. I was scared of what he said about the police and me giving a tip off to Joe Graben. I headed back to the elevator and then ducked out the side door and followed him. I was afraid he was going to tell the cops something about me. Where did he go? Well, he walked up a couple of blocks to a little all-night lunchroom, and Betty Lanning was there waiting for him. Thank you, my dear. You've been of great help to me. Perhaps I will give you the hundred dollars that Peter Harley refused to pay you. Oh, yeah, I just bet. You will come with me. There's a matter of establishing identity of the corpse beyond reasonable doubt. I ain't going anywhere with you. I don't even know you. You will, my dear. Of course... If you prefer to have an introduction to the police... Okay, okay, I'm coming. Say, you uh, got a real fancy place here. Yes. Yes, the classic beauty of Grecian architecture soothes the nerves of the bereaved. Right this way, my dear. Mr. Graben's been calling you about the body he... Oh? Surprised to see a fellow employee from the nightclub, Betty? Hey, wait a minute. You're the new piano player in the club. How come you're over... You must be mistaken. I work here. Oh, no, I ain't mistaken. You play the piano... I'm afraid bluffing won't do you much good, Betty. And, uh... I want to apologize to you. Apologize? For what? Well, I thought you were rather lazy and shiftless the way you've been coming in late in the mornings, and here I discover you're holding down both a day and a night job. Rather admirable. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, don't deny it, my dear. I would be rather proud if, if I were you. Won't you show Miss Dare back to the receiving room, Betty? Uh, Miss Dare? But why? She wants to identify a... Uh, a friend. I, I... All right, but I don't have any key. I... I have. And I'm going with you. This way, Miss Dare. I'm surprised you didn't tell me about your other job, Betty. Just a minute. Show the body, Betty. It's this one over here that she's interested in. All right. All right. Oh, Pete. Pete, what have you done to him? You, you murdered him. Ah, so you knew the man, too. You and Miss Dare both. You killed him. You'll never get away with this. I did not kill the man, but I really can't let you run around screaming that I did. You've been working for me and working for Joe Graben. I wonder who else you're working for. I... What do you mean? I wonder if perhaps you might not be a spy. 
I wonder if you might not have put this man's body in here. You're insane. A man should know his employees better, Miss Lanning. I really think it's time for us to have a heart-to-heart talk. I've nothing to say to you. I have an idea you'll change your mind about that. Hello. Actually, I just assume you didn't. You'd make such a beautiful corpse. Well, you, you wouldn't dare kill me. You, hey, you. this is where I leave. I'm sorry, Miss Dear. I'll have to insist that you stay. Has uh, Harry left yet, Miss Lanning? But, no, he... He was cleaning the chapel. Oh, fine. I was afraid he might have gone. And he does so want some experience in embalming. Is Carl Renfrum actually going to kill Betty Lanning? And who killed Peter Harley, the detective? Why was his body left in the Renfrum funeral home? We'll find out in the second act of tonight's story. Meanwhile, here's news from your sponsor. The scene is the receiving room of the Renfrum funeral home, and Harry Canby, Renfrum's assistant, is arranging the embalming equipment. You haven't got the nerve. You wouldn't dare. If it was me, I wouldn't bet on that, sister. If I was you, I'd start talking. The start of the embalming process is very important, Harry. If you will uh, give me the needle, please. Well, you can't embalm a live person. You... Oh, a common misconception, Betty. On the contrary... Get away from me! Don't you dare touch me! Perhaps you're ready to talk now. I... What do you want? You're working with the police, I suppose. Working with this Peter Harley. Are you kidding? When I joke, you always see a smile on my lips. And my sense of humor is weak. I seldom joke. I was working for Lou Dana. Lou Dana? Why, he's Joe Graben's worst enemy. Sure. Some of Lou Dana's spies, his undercover boys, began having accidents. And the accidents always turned up here. So Lou hired me to get a job here and tell him what was going on. Mr. Dana must be a smart man. He's smarter than you, Renfron. And smarter than Graben. I was giving him the dope every time a body came into this place from Graben. Yes, but this job of yours as a piano player. Graben never saw me here. His bodies always came in the back way. I was doing so well here, Lou got the idea of having me work at Graben's place, too. We were finding out everything Graben was doing. Mm, a much smarter girl than I gave you credit for being, Miss Lane. And you better be careful how you treat me, too. Because Lou Dana's got enough on you to hang you. If I were in your place, Miss Lanning, I should worry about my own neck. The police are going to be quite angry about Peter Harley. I didn't kill him. I was giving him all the dope on Graben's mob. The dope about Graben and you. Hmm. I suppose so. You know, Miss Lanning, I find such disloyalty rather distressing. Miss Dare, what would you do if you were I, under such circumstances? You leave me out of this. I ain't playing. I should hate to think that Joe Graben would double-cross me in view of all that I've done for him. I bet Graben bumped off this Harley guy, boss. Well, of course he did. Probably had someone following Peter Harley and me. And when Graben finds out how Betty spilled everything she knew... He has his Harley fellow erased. Hmm. Perhaps uh, you could contribute something to the conversation about now, Miss Dear. I, uh... I, I don't think Joe would do a thing like that. Oh, come now, Miss Dare. You told me you followed Harley and saw him meet Miss Lanning. You were angry because he hadn't given you the hundred dollars he had promised. Now, it isn't logical that you would let such a opportunity for revenge pass. So it was you who tipped off Graben, huh? Why, you dirty little... I ain't a stool pigeon or a double-crossing rat like you. Sure, I called Joe. Why wouldn't oh, I? Oh, you... Oh, please, please, ladies, please. This is hardly the place for such talk. We're in the presence of the dead. You know, Harry, this rather hurts me. Huh? Joe Graben, he's, he's been such a fine customer. And to think he tried to take advantage of me. 
I think we'll have to call him over here and uh, sever business relations. What's the matter, Renfran? Cops making a fuss about the guy I brung in last night? Which one, Mr. Graven? What do you mean, which one? Oh, really, Mr. Graven, you hurt me deeply. I've always endeavored to give you the finest service. Funerals worthy of uh, much finer people than those that you have brought me. Everything has always been conducted on the highest plane. With the finest music, the most excellent caskets, beautiful flowers. Okay, okay, quit selling me. I ain't kicking. I'd paid you plenty, too. I never beefed on the prices. What's wrong with you? If you wanted the free funeral for one of your victims, why didn't you ask me? I don't like deceit and trickery, Mr. Graben. You're off your nut. I don't know what you're talking about. This uh, extra corpse you slipped in here last night, Mr. Graben. Are you crazy? I brought in one. Harry's seen me. I told him all about it. it wasn't even a hot job. Ah, but the one you brought with him, Mr. Graben. The one you neglected to report. You lie. Please, Mr. Graben. Perhaps uh, you'd like to see him. This way, please. I don't know nothing about it. One stiff I brought in. One. And if you think you're going to shake me down to pay for somebody else's corpse, you've got another thing coming. One moment, please. In here. Hello, Joe. Hey, what's it? Marie Dare and Betty. Say, what's going on here anyhow? One thing that's going on, Joe. We found out what a rat your new piano player is. Lou Dana she was working for, spying on oh, you. quiet, please, Miss Dare, quiet. Teacher will know what a good girl you've been without you being so immodest. I'll tell him all about it. This is one of your nightclub's late patrons, Mr. Graven. Him? Yeah, I've seen him around. Been murdered, ain't he? I bet you don't know how or where either, do you? Me? How should I know? Your little pal, Marie Dare, told us how she called you and told you this detective was meeting me. She's put you right on the spot. Huh? I wasn't putting you on any spot, Joe. She was giving this detective all the dope on you. She was a spy. Taking pay from you and giving Lou Dane all the dope on everything that was going on around your place. And you told him you phoned me and told me about it? Why'd you say a thing like that, Marie? Because I did. Well, there must have been a couple of other people. You never talked to me. Oh, your protests of innocence are touching, Mr. Graben. But they're necessary. Nobody's going to hand me a rap for killing a dick. That is not the point. It is as far as I'm concerned. Our friend Betty, who seems to have been working for both of us, isn't going to give you the benefit of any doubt if this should come into court. Peter Harley was on your trail trying to get something on you. Yeah? Well... I didn't know about it. Betty, a member of a rival gang, was telling him anything that she could that would get you into trouble with the police. Marie Dare tipped you off as to what was going on. She never did. She did. She says she did. She has no apparent motive for lying. Peter Harley's been murdered. Do you think you would want the case to go to court, Mr. Craven? I suppose it's got to. No, not necessarily. Not if uh, you arrange for the right kind of a funeral. You mean you can cover this thing up? Such things have been arranged in the past, but uh, this is going to be an expensive lesson for you, Mr. Graven. Yeah? What do you mean? Somebody has tried to victimize me into putting out a free funeral. Huh. This man died trying to uphold the law. A noble hero shot down in the prime of his life. He deserves last rites of genuine elegance. Okay. How much do you want? I should say about um, $50,000 should cover it very nicely. Fifty thousand? Well, that's blackmail. Oh, but it will be a superb funeral. Flowers, special carpet at the cemetery, the red one, even the quartet. You'll guarantee I don't take the rep if I pay you the dough? When the Renfront Funeral Home takes charge of a funeral, I assume every responsibility. I guarantee you that you'll never be charged with Peter Harley's murder. Of course, Mr. Graben, you, uh, you will make the payment in cash in advance.
Okay, you got your dough. I guess I can go now. Have uh, you finished counting the money, Harry? Yeah, yeah, 50 grand. It's okay. I ain't gonna forget the way you shook me down, Mr. Renfram. No, I don't suppose you will. Give me the money, Harry. Uh, here you are, boss. Thank you, Harry. Oh, by the way, uh, I'm afraid I'll have to dispense with your services. Huh? I mean, you're fired. But, but I ain't done anything, boss. I ain't... I could hardly have a murderer working for me, Harry. Particularly such a stupid murderer. What do you mean? Listen, I ain't murdered anybody. Hey, what gives? What's this all about anyway? Peter Harley came here last night and asked to see the body that was in the receiving room. He showed his police credentials, I imagine, and demanded to see it. No, he wasn't here. You took him back to the receiving room. You were panic-stricken because you thought you would be in trouble, that you would be implicated in the work we've been doing for Joe Graben. Ah, you're making this up. You've been receiving most of Mr. Graben's... Mr. Graben's cases at night. You thought you'd be in it up to your neck. So, you shot the detective. You killed him yourself. You Hardly. Peter Harley and I were working together. You and Harley? Why, you dirty rat. When you, you brought your first case to me, Mr. Graben, I was scared to death. So I went to the police. And you got the nerve to admit it? They told me to play along with you, to tip them off. They've been building up a chain of evidence that will send you to the electric chair. Thanks to me. And you've been collecting from Joe Graben all the time? <laughs> Naturally, my dear. Even the gangster dead must have burial. I didn't kill Harley, I tell you. You did it yourself. You have a key, too. Yes? Try telling that to the police, Harry. I'm afraid you'll uh, irritate them. You see, Harry, they tipped me off a long time ago that you were one of Graben's boys, that you came to work for me because Graben had decided I was to be his undertaker. Then then I'll confess that Graben told me to shoot Harley. Yeah. Why, you louse. Try to ring me in on your mistake, will you? You told me to do it. I'll stick to that. Unless you get me out of here. I can do that, all right. This gun will do the trick. Joe, you ain't going to shoot us. I ought to shoot Renfron, taking my dough and then tipping off the cops, shaking me down for 50 grand. Come on, we got to get out of here, Joe. You sip. Okay, come on. I got a key, Joe. We'll leave Renfron and the dames locked in here. Let them try to explain Peter Holly's body. Yeah. Oh, fine spot you got us in now. When the cop comes... My dear... I don't believe you realize how lucky you are that Joe Graben didn't shoot you. Really, I don't. If I weren't a law-abiding citizen, I would be tempted to do it myself. You played unfair with me, too, you know. Hey, what's that? The police. I had the place literally honeycombed with them. Oh, my, I hope the bullets didn't hit any of my precious objects yard. Like most of them hit Harry and Joe Graben. Yes, the wages of sin. But I suppose I really owe them free funerals. Yeah, complete with quartet.
If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. If you have a true story that you'd like to tell on the show, something paranormal that's happened to you or somebody you know, you can share it by clicking on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com and might use your story in a future episode. We now continue with Weird Darkness and Native American legends, starting with the legend of the little deer. This Cherokee tale is interesting because it relates a philosophy of life which was practiced by many Native Americans. They used every part of the animal they hunted if possible, and showed respect for the life they had to take to survive. This is not the case in most cultures. So why the difference? This legend may help us understand. It's the legend of the little deer. The Cherokee say that in the early days of the world, all animals and plants could talk, and people respected them, only taking what they needed to survive. If animals and plants could talk to us, perhaps that would still be true. However, a change came about when the people invented the bow and arrow. Suddenly, they could hurt with much more ease and started killing indiscriminately, reveling in their newfound power. The animals called a council to decide what to do about this terrible change in order. The bears thought that if they could use a bow and arrow as well, the humans would think twice about what they were doing. But there was a problem. The bears found they could not shoot the bow and arrow, because their claws interfered. One bear decided he would cut off his claws so he could use the weapon. The strategy was effective, and he found he could aim and shoot quite well. He was very proud that he had solved the problem. But then, one of the elder bears spoke up. He asked whether the bear who had shot the bow so well could now climb a tree. The bear found he could not climb the tree without his claws, and so the idea of using the human weapon was thrown out. However, because the bears were the first to suggest harm to the humans, the hunter was not required to ask pardons for killing bears. The deer had a different idea. Awiusti, little deer, said that he would teach the humans in their dreams how to show respect for the life of that they hunted, and only take what they needed. If the humans did not perform the proper rituals of respect, Little Deer would cause them to become diseased with rheumatism. Little Deer visited the humans in their dreams, and some paid heed to the warning, but others thought this was just an ordinary dream, not a message. Some still decided to go out and kill indiscriminately. These hunters soon found themselves stricken with illness which made their muscles weak and caused them to be unable to hunt effectively. By this, it was shown that the dream of Little Deer was a true dream, and the people decided that they should observe rituals of respect for the life they took, as well as being careful to use every part of the creature whose life they had cut short. The other animals had separate meetings, and all devised terrible ailments as punishments for the disrespect humans had shown them. Only the plants decided to help the humans, as they did not feel they had been treated badly by them. The plants decided that each of them would come up with a different remedy to counter all of the diseases that the animals had invented to plague the humans. So disease came into the world, and the humans were forced to learn respect for the life that sustained them. If not for the plants, the human species would have been doomed. After that, it was said that every plant had a use, even the weeds, if only the humans could discover its valuable properties. When a doctor did not know a remedy for a disease, it was possible to find it 
by asking aid from the spirits of the plants. What does this philosophy say about humans? It seems that the Cherokee felt that humans were wasteful and violent creatures. The only way to make them show respect was with threats of harm, punishments, and judgments. When we look at the modern world, we might be inclined to agree. The Native Americans lived in harmony with the land and creatures upon it. Perhaps if we had all grown up with legends such as this, we would also show respect for all life. The Cherokee recall a white-skinned race that lived on their lands before they arrived. This group of very unusual beings were known as the Moon-Eyed People. Cherokee legends tell the Moon-Eyed People were of small stature and had pale, white skin, blonde hair, and blue eyes. They were called Moon-Eyed because they had very sensitive eyes and were unable to see in daylight. They could, however, see very well at night. Since these mysterious ancient people were blinded by the sun, they were forced to live in underground caverns. The moon-eyed people were physically totally different from the Cherokee, and when these two races encountered each other, war broke out. The moon-eyed people were first mentioned in a 1797 book by Benjamin Smith Barton. Later documentation tells of similar accounts, such as an 1823 book, The Natural and Aboriginal History of Tennessee which tells of a band of white people who were killed or driven out of Kentucky and West Tennessee. According to the Cherokee, the Moon-Eyed people lived in Appalachia until the Cherokee expelled them. The Moon-Eyed people are said to have built some ancient structures in the area. One of them is Fort Mountain in Georgia. It is an 850-foot-long zigzagging stone wall that is 12 feet thick and up to 7 feet high. The age of the wall has never been properly determined, but according to some sources, it was built around 400 to 500 AD. Who really built Fort Mountain is still a mystery. Cherokee legends tell the ancient structure was raised either by the Moonite people or Madoc, a Welsh prince who came to America in 1170. Former Tennessee Governor John Sevier wrote that the Cherokee leader, Okanastota, told him in 1783 that local mounds had been built by white people who were pushed from the area by the ascendant Cherokee. According to Savier, Okanastota confirmed that these were Welsh from across the ocean. The identity of the Moon-Eyed people is unknown. Who were these mysterious, small, pale beings who lived underground? One theory suggests these people were of Welsh origin, being descendants of Maddox colonists. An ancient structure almost identical to the Fort Mountain can be found near DeSoto Falls, Alabama. It's possible it was built by these Welsh settlers after they left Fort Mountain. There are two Cherokee legends that could shed some light on this ancient mystery. One legend reveals that the Cherokee defeated the Moon-Eyed people and drove them from their homeland during a full moon. Another version tells the Cherokee chased the Moon-Eyed people away from their home at Hiawassee a village near what is now Murphy, North Carolina, west into Tennessee. According to both Cherokee legends, the Moon-Eyed People went underground. That's all we know. The Moon-Eyed People and their fate remains an unsolved ancient mystery. After all this time, we may never find out what happened to the white-skinned race because the truth lies buried somewhere in antiquity and may never be unearthed. Nevertheless, the legend of the Moon-Eyed People and their encounter with the Cherokee is truly fascinating. Coming up next on Weird Darkness, we continue with Native American lore. We've probably all heard of the Wendigo, or if not, well, you certainly will hear soon. But first, the Dark Watchers, and just that name itself can strike fear into your heart when Weird Darkness returns. Thank you. 
When Salem Roanoke took a job near his family's new home as a hired hand in the Texas Hill Country, he anticipated learning the rancher's trade, but a series of strange events, shocking murders, and unholy revelations divert him down another path. This terrifying trajectory puts him directly into the middle of a struggle between monsters, magic, and men. Armed and backed by a militia of ranchers, Salem attempts to combat the creeping tide of evil that threatens to engulf his new home and destroy the people most important to him. Will Salem manage to save his home, or have his actions condemn everyone he hopes to save? The Witch Trials – A Summer of Wolves and Season of the Witch by S. R. Roanoke Available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook versions. Look for The Witch Trials by S. R. Roanoke on Amazon or find it on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. Something's wrong, isn't it? Shh, don't wake the children. It's the oxygenator, isn't it? Yes, but that's not all. I thought so. The motor? No, the motor's fine. You can hear it for yourself. It's the generator I'm worried about. What's wrong with it? The fuel tanks. I think the blast shook them and they developed a slow leak. We've been losing fuel steadily for over three months now. Isn't there anything we can do to fix it? You know as well as I do that we can't. They're buried the same as we are, 40 feet away under 20 feet of earth. Even if I could dig over to them, it wouldn't do any good. The fuel's almost gone. Oh, Ed, what are we going to do? I don't know. How much time do we have left? I don't know. One day, maybe two. Oh, Ed, I'm frightened. And for the children's sake, try not to be. What are we going to do? Try to live today just as if it were any other day. <laughs> Theater 5 presents A House of Cards. Up. Oh, everybody get up. Another day. Come on. What, what time is it? It's time to get ready for school. Oh, I don't want to have school again today. I want to go outside and play. Now, Mark, let's not start that again today. Get up and get dressed, Mark. We need somebody to make the egg cycle go. Mother's going to make eggs this morning, and we'll need the extra power for the ventilator. Oh, boy, eggs. Oh, Mary, big deal, eggs. Every day it's the same old thing. Get up, ride the egg cycle, have school, take a nap, read, have more school. Mark... I want to go outside and play. Play? Now, Mark, you know very well why we can't go outside and play. The next thing you know, you'll have Mary all upset. Now, get dressed. We need the egg cycle to make the ventilator go over these eggs. Uh, Daddy, yesterday Mark said that the bomb was a hundred megaton that hit us. I did not. I did too. I did not. All right, all right. That's enough. Well, how big was it, Daddy? I don't know. It, it was a hundred megatons, wasn't it, Dad? Mm. No. See? On the radio, they said it was a hundred megatons. Let's not talk about the bomb. It's all right, Ann. On the radio, they said it was between 50 and 100. They didn't know for sure. They have no way of knowing. Well, did it knock down our house? Yes. And my school? Probably. How about uh, Grandpa and Grandma's house? I don't know. I think not. They're pretty far away. Are Grandpa and Grandma still alive? Ed. It's all right, Ann. I think they're still alive, Mary. 
Grandpa's a pretty smart man. He could have gotten them away before the fire got to them. Oh, Mark said there was nobody left alive in the world but us. Mark. I did not. You did too. Now, Mark, that was a terrible thing to say. Well, then how come we can't get anything on the radio anymore? Ed, I don't think this is a subject we ought to discuss before breakfast. I think it's better they know the truth when they ask for it, Anne. It's better than guessing about half-truths. Now, there could be any number of reasons why we can't pick up anything on the radio anymore, Mark. Maybe... maybe our antenna was destroyed by the firestorm that followed the blast. Maybe it's covered with radioactive ash. We know that most of the major cities were hit the same time ours was. Now, maybe the smaller cities don't have broadcasting stations powerful enough to reach us. It could be any number of things. But I can assure you of one thing. Somewhere, somehow, there are people left. Is, is my bicycle gone, too? Yes. And the swing? Oh, I knew this was going to lead to no good. Now, Mark, you march over to the X-Cycle and get it going. This place is getting full of smoke. Now, Mary, darling, you wash your face and get out your homework. We're going to study fractions today. And you didn't do too well last time. Ed? Yes? The children are asleep now. You gave them a pill? Mm Mm-hmm. And their orange juice. It should be safe to talk now. What are we going to do? I don't know. I've been thinking about it. Couldn't we run for it? What do you mean? When the air gives out in here, pick up the children and run. Maybe if we run fast and long enough, maybe we could get out of it. I've thought about that, too. But the circle of radiation may be anywhere from 50 to 100 miles, depending on the size of the bomb and the wind drift. We couldn't make it in a day or two days, even if we ran. Can't we open the ventilators? No, no, it's still too hot out there. The exterior Geiger counter still reads more than 80 wrenches an hour. If we open the exterior ventilator an hour, it'd be as radioactive in here as it is out there. Why has it stayed so hot so long? You said that within three months it would cool down long enough for us to leave. I thought it would. But what's gone wrong? I don't know. Any number of things could have. Maybe we were closer to the blast than we figured we would be. Maybe we're covered with radioactive earth. It could be any number of things. Couldn't we open the door and see? No. No, it's too hot to expose the children to. It could ruin them. Just a crack? I'm afraid not. Oh. I wonder what time it is. Two o'clock. No, I mean, I wonder what time it is outside. About the same. We don't even know what time it is. The day of the week or anything. Yes, we do. I've kept it all marked off on the calendar. Yes, but how many times has the clock stopped? Twice? Three times? Exactly twice. Because you forgot to wind because it. Because we both forgot to wind well, it. Well, I can't do everything. Cook meals on a single burner, keep house and raise two children in a nine by twelve room. Damn. Oh, I'm sorry, Ed. I didn't mean to snap at you that way. I'm just so tired of it all. It seems you try so hard and you never win. You build a fallout shelter to be safe from the bomb... And you have to worry about the firestorms that follow. Uh, so you make it completely self-contained. Water, food, air. Enough to last you six months in case the radiation's hotter than you think. Annie. And the blast knocks the fuel line loose. And all your plans go up in the air like a puff of smoke. Oh, Annie. It just isn't fair, Ed. It just isn't Annie, fair. And you've got to control yourself. I'm tired of being in control of myself. It's like a house of cards. You put one in wrong and the whole thing comes tumbling down. Annie, please. It isn't fair. It just isn't Annie. fair. Annie. Annie. Is that it? Is that the generator? No. No, that's the oxygenator. When the generator goes, everything will go. The lights, water, everything. And we, we've got to make some decisions. Listen... What? Listen. It sounds like digging. There it is. Do you hear it? 
Yes, I can hear it. Yes, you're right. It is digging. They found us. Somebody's trying to rescue us. And wait. They're here. We're safe. And stay away from that door. But they're here. They found us. And we have no way of knowing who's on the other side of that door. The Geiger counter says it's 80 wrenches an hour out there. A rescue crew wouldn't enter an area this hot even with protective clothing. But who else could it be? I don't know. But whoever it is, we'd better make sure before we let him in. If he's been wandering around long out there, he won't be pretty to look at. Listen, he's still at it. Whoever it is, he's kept it up over two hours. Who's out there, Dad? I don't know, Marky, but we're going to find out. Hand me that Geiger counter, son. You're not going out. No, I just want to get a radiation reading in the airlock. Here it is, Dad. Stand back at the table, Ann, and keep Mary behind you. All right, stand behind your father, Mark. There's a reading of ten just inside the inner door. Water in here. 10, 20, 40 at the door. That's hot. That means it's in excess of 80 outside. Who's out there, Daddy? I don't know. Let's see if I can make him hear us. There's someone out there, all right. He hears me, but he won't answer. Who do you suppose it is? I don't know. Bill Bigler. What? Bill Bigler from over the next block. He's the only one in our neighborhood that built a fallout shelter besides us. But what would he be doing out there? He's got a Geiger counter. He knows it's too hot to be moving around out there. Food. What? Food. They've run out of food. Do you suppose? I know it is. I talked to Alice on the phone the day after they finished their shelter. She asked me how much food we were stocking, and I said enough for six months. Well, she laughed and said they were only stocking for three months. Bill said no radiation would linger beyond that, and if it did, they wouldn't want to come up to see what the world looked like. Could be. This is almost the fourth month. They could have lasted this long if they'd stretched things. I know it's them. Oh, they must be starving. We've got to help them. No. And they're our neighbors. We never so much as spoke to them until we built our shelters. But they're human beings. Ed, I'm warning you. Stay away from that door. Ed, why? Ann, put that rifle down. You're frightening the children. If you open that door, Ed Johnson, I swear I'll shoot you. Ann, try to be reasonable. I am being reasonable. You can't build a shelter to protect your family from radiation and then throw it open to a total stranger. Bill Bigler is not a total stranger. He is if he's contaminated with radiation poisoning. And all I plan to do is put some food and water in the airlock. I'll open the outer door and lock the inner one. No. He, he, he can't get inside with the inner door locked. No, but the radiation can. You told me that. Not that much. Enough. You know that. Enough to hurt the children. But, Anne, those people are starving to death. Well, let them starve. Anne. Alice Bigler laughed when I told her we stockpiled enough food and water for six months. Well, let her laugh now. Anne, this is insanity. I mean what I say, Ed. Mommy, please don't. Anne, you're frightening the children. Please put the gun down. Please, Mom. Uh, Why did the lights go out? Mark, go get the flashlight. Well, what happened, Dad? We just run out of fuel, that's all. Will we be all right, Dad? Yes, yes, nothing's wrong. I'll take care of it. It's time to go to bed anyway. Everybody undress and hop into bed. What about the man outside? Don't worry, he can't get in. I won't let him hurt you. I'm scared. Daddy, I'm scared. Don't be, Mary. It's all right, honey. East. 
still at it. Yes, but he's getting weaker. What's he doing out there? It sounds like he's trying to pry the door open. Depending on how long he's been out there, he must be pretty sick. He's probably leaning against the door, vomiting. Oh, Ed, please. I'm sorry. Are the children asleep? Yes, finally. What are we going to do? I don't know. Ed, couldn't we please try and run for it? And the most distance we could cover would be 20, 30 miles. In places, the ashes would be hit deep, maybe higher. In the end, we'd, we'd wind up like him. There just wouldn't be any point in it. Couldn't we try and open the air vents? No, it's still too radioactive for that. We, we might just as well open the door. Oh, why has it stayed so hot for so long? The brochures, everything said you'd be able to leave at the end of three months, four at the most. Now, what went wrong? If I knew, Anne, I... We wouldn't be here. So many things can go wrong that you never count on. Maybe we were just too close to the blast. I don't know. How much air do you think we have left? An hour. Maybe less. What'll happen then? The oxygen in the room will be gone and... We'll start breathing our own carbon dioxide. Will it be bad? I don't know. If you're asleep, it shouldn't be bad. Certainly not as bad as being out there. Do you think we'd stay asleep through it? I was just wondering about that. If we took sleeping pills? Yes. Then I think so. Well, then that's the way I want us to go, Ed. Asleep. And all of us together. That's what I was thinking, too. I'll have to wake the children. What for? To give them a pill. I don't want either of them to wake up trying to breathe. All right, dear, but hurry. Time is running out. I'll put some food and water in the airlock. But why? You said it wouldn't do him any good. I know, I know. But maybe it'd be nice if just once before he dies... He knows the world isn't completely devoid of human beings. Hurry, Ann, the air is getting bad. Mary, Mark. Wake up, Mark. Hmm? I want you to take these. Is it time to get up yet? No, darling. Just drink this and go back to sleep. Tell me when it's time to get up. I will. Mary, Mary. Uh, what? Well, Mother wants you to take these. What for? To help you sleep. I don't want any. Oh, but, Mary, they're good for you. I don't want any. Ed. Ed, I... Oh, that's I, all right. I, uh, here. Give them to me. Uh, Mary, you have to take your pills, honey. We're all taking them. See? I'm taking mine. And mommy's going to take hers. Oh. What are they? We're just sleeping pills so we can all go to sleep together. Will we wake up together? Yes, if if we wake up, we'll all wake up the way we went to sleep together. Oh, I want some pills, too. Here you are, honey. Oh, good night, Mommy. Good night, Daddy. Good night, Mary. I don't want to cry. It's all right, dear. I love them both so much. I know. I love them, too. I love you all. Everything. So much. I love you, darling. I'm sorry I couldn't make it work. I tried. I tried very hard. I know. We all tried. It's not your fault. It was just a house of cards. That's all. It couldn't work. I love you, Anne. Just hold me, dear. Try to sleep. Hold me and sleep. 
Sleepy. Love you. Sleep. Get those stretchers in here. Take the children first. Take the woman's pulse, Greg. She got too hysterical near the end. Do we have those stomachs pumped, Doctor? No, they took only one sleeping pill apiece. That much will just help them sleep the whole thing off. Be careful with those children there. Would you say the experiment was a success? Yeah. A family of four in a nine by twelve fallout shelter for nine months? Yes, I'd say they did pretty well. But they lost touch with reality toward the end. You probably would have too if your only contact with reality was a radio. And suddenly that was taken away from you. But they really thought they were survivors in a fallout shelter. The last people left alive on Earth. Greg, that was the purpose of the experiment. To change the variables until you find the breaking point. Anybody can survive when everything's running smoothly. But break their communication... Disrupt their fuel supply, threaten them with the unknown from without. And they did pretty well. For two months, they wouldn't mention to each other that they were losing fuel. Neither one would mention it, for fear of frightening the others. They did pretty well. Then the experiment was a success. No, the experiment wasn't a success, but the people were. As long as people have to hide under the ground... All experiments are failures, but maybe we can learn how to protect the people so they can outlive the failures of experimenters. Watch that stretcher there. Be as gentle as you can. That's a human being you're carrying. presented A House of Cards, written by George Bamber and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Vicki Bola, George Petrie, Bryna Rayburn, Cecil Roy, and Guy Sorrell. Audio engineers Bill Sandreuter and Marty Folia. Sound technicians Ed Blaney and M.C. Brock. Original music by Alexander Vlastatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, Box 233, New York, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. Have you seen the Monster Channel? It has horror hosts, B-horror movies, retro television commercials, and a whole lot more. You can watch it anytime, absolutely free, 24-7, 365, on the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com. 
That's also where we hold our monthly Weirdo Watch Party, where we find a terrible B-horror movie and a horror host that's presenting it, and we all join together and watch the movie at the same time, make jokes in the chat room. It's always a lot of fun. You can find out when the next Weirdo Watch Party is on that same page. It's the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com. Speaking of watching, let's continue with Weird Darkness and Native American lore with The Dark Watchers. Who or what the Dark Watchers are, no one knows. Where these elusive beings came from and where they go remains a mystery. They leave without a footprint. They are mentioned in a number of ancient legends and are well known in several U.S. states. The Dark Watchers are apparently giant, human-like phantoms that are only seen at twilight, standing silhouetted against the night sky along the ridges and peaks of the mountain range. When spotted, the beings are usually seen staring off into the open air of the mountains, seemingly at nothing in particular, before vanishing into thin air occasionally right before the spectator's eyes. In their book, In Search of the Dark Watchers, authors Thomas Steinbeck and Benjamin Brode write that the Romans coined the original term, and in ancient times this spirit was envisaged as an actual creature, a guardian animal or supernatural being such as an elf, a fairy, or ghost. How far away from this original idea are the Dark Watchers? Over time, beliefs of literal spirits were discarded, and less supernatural concepts have prevailed. In modern times, there are some people who say they have encountered a Dark Watcher, but what these giant beings are looking for or watching is beyond anyone's current comprehension. There are no scientific explanations, only speculations. In the book Weird California, it is said the Chumash Indians first spoke of them in legends and their cave painters drew of them in their colorful wall drawings. Later, legendary author John Steinbeck described them in his short story, Flight. Pepe looked up to the top of the next dry, withered ridge. He saw a dark form against the sky, a man's figure standing on top of a rock, and he glanced away quickly not to appear curious. When a moment later he looked up again, the figure was gone. Also in 1937, the poet Robinson Jeffers mentioned them in his poem, Such Counsels You Gave to Me, as forms that look human but certainly are not human. If Jeffers or Steinbeck ever actually saw one of the Watchers is unknown, but the local legend has been around since long before they wrote about it. In the mid-60s, a Monterey Peninsula local who was the first principal of a local high school saw them while hiking in the mountains. He had enough time to study the dark figure, to see its clothing, and notice how the figure was strangely studying the mountains. When the principal called out to his fellow hikers, the figure disappeared. Other more recent sightings have included a dark hat and cape in the description of the mountain residing phantoms. The Dark Watchers are sometimes also referred to as the Old Ones. They predate the coming of the white man in America and all Native American tribes have stories about them. It is said that Spanish explorers encountered these enigmatic beings and several Mexican soldiers also reported seeing them. The origin and identity of these mysterious beings remain an unexplained ancient mystery that baffles us until this day. This next section is something I have shared in the podcast before, but with this episode's sole focus being on Native American myths and legends, I just couldn't leave it out. In some myths of the Algonquin tribes of North America, there is a mythological creature, Wendigo, that takes different forms. It is a cannibal, a monster. When there is nothing left to eat, it starves to death. When it sees something, it wants to own it. No one else can have anything. This illness feeds on a spiritual void. The Wendigo is a danger that surrounds us. It is not only a creature from myths and legends of the ancients. The Algonquin Native Americans represent the most extensive and numerous North American groups, with hundreds of tribes speaking several related dialects of the language group Algonquian. They lived in most of the Canadian territory, 
below the Hudson Bay and between the Atlantic Ocean and the Rocky Mountains. Their rich mythology and their beliefs survived many generations, and so did the Wendigo, a monster and boogeyman. This cannibal monster, also known as Windigo or Wingigo, is an evil man-eating spirit. However, his abilities and evil doings vary depending on the locality where the legends were gathered. Generally, the Wendigo has certain characteristics of a human or an evil spirit. By possessing a human being, the Wendigo can change his or her form to become a cannibal. The Wendigo, a malevolent, supernatural being, is associated with cannibalism, murder, and voracious greed, and this kind of behavior has always been condemned in these indigenous communities. In some myths and legends of the Algonquin-speaking peoples, those who commit sins such as selfishness, greed, or cannibalism are turned into a Wendigo as punishment. Among the peoples of Canada, around the Barrens Lake located in Manitoba, Canada, along the eastern shore of Lake Winnipeg, the Wendigo is an amphibious being like an alligator with bear's feet or cloven hooves. In the beliefs of the Chippewa Indians, also known as the Ojibwe, the evil creature is an ogre which is focused on children to obtain their compliant behavior. Along with other indigenous tribes such as Eastern Cree, West Main Swampy Cree, Nascapi, and Innu, the Ojibwe describe the Wendigo as a giant many times larger than human beings. In Algonquin folklore, however, the Wendigo is the spirit of a lost hunter who now mercilessly preys upon humans in a cannibalistic manner. The Wendigo is never happy. He is never satisfied with his killings and consuming of the bodies. He is constantly searching for new victims. His hunger is limitless. As I said, when there is nothing left to eat, it starves to death. When it sees something, it wants to own it. No one else can have anything. This illness feeds on a spiritual void. It is not only a creature from myths and legends of the ancients. The Wendigo is a danger that surrounds all of us. Numerous mythical stories explain Earth's creation and how it came to be. Among the Algonquin folk tales and traditional stories which belong to 35 different Native American tribes from Long Island to California, there is one myth about Glooskap, also known as Gluskabi, a trickster god, a mythic hero who, according to some myths, made the whole world from the body of his own mother. It is said that Glooskap came from the east, though he had the form of a man. He taught the Indians all that they know, everything from the names of the stars to how to hunt and fish, and it's portrayed in most stories as a wise man. His brother, Malsum, a wolf god, was also a creator god, but according to the Algonquins, he was responsible for creating all the evil things of this world that threatened and infuriated human beings. Glooskap was considered the protector of humankind, while Malsum was constantly trying to harm people. However, Glooskap could get very angry at those who did not follow his advices. According to one Algonquin story, a young man goes to Glooskap asking for help in finding a wife. The man is ugly and has been avoided by hundreds of women whom he'd asked to be his wife. Glooskap gives him a small parcel, with instructions not to open the package until he gets home. Though the man's friends beg him not to open it on the way home, the man simply cannot resist his curiosity. He opens the package, and hundreds of beautiful young women fly out in all directions and bury the man beneath their weight. His cries for help are in vain and moments later he is crushed into the earth. The next morning all the women have vanished and all that's left are the remains of the young man's crushed bones lying on the ground. Glooskap also had no mercy for those who asked him for immortality. He simply turned them into rocks or trees, though in general he is a benevolent deity who will grant most reasonable requests. In one version of this creation story, Glooskap's brother Malsum killed him with the feather of an owl, the only thing that can harm Glooskap. 
but the great benevolent hero returned to life and killed evil Malsum with a fern, so Malsum became an evil wolf, Lux. Still, Glooscap had to defeat evil sorcerers, Kuaqua and Metasolan, Malsum's demon followers who tried to avenge their leader's death. The legend has it that Glooscap finally defeated the forces of evil, and when this was done, he gave a great feast for all the animals on the shores of Lake Minas, and then sailed off in his canoe. The animals, who had previously all spoken the same language, discovered that each species spoke a different language once he had gone. Glooscap is sometimes depicted as a rabbit, though it is said that he, as a shapeshifter, can take whatever shape he wants. He is expected to return as a savior of his people when they are most in need. There are so many legends and myths from Native American culture, and while I would never be able to touch on all of them, I do have a final few that deserve mention when Weird Darkness returns. A hunting party in search of moose gets separated in the Canadian wilderness. One of the party members is abducted by the legendary Wendigo, a novella written by Algernon Blackwood. The Wendigo. Author Robert Eichmann once said of the story it is one of the possibly six great masterpieces in the field. The Wendigo by Algernon Blackwood. You can hear the entire book absolutely free on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. forward into time, into the years beyond 2000 A.D. What strange adventures, what exciting things will we find in the world of tomorrow? 2000 Plus. Today, an adventure of outer space, when the worlds met. year 2000 plus 20. At the giant spaceport in Washington, D.C., temporary capital of the Federated World Government, an enormous throng, tense with expectancy, jams every available inch of space surrounding the rocket landing field. All eyes strain upward into the clear blue sky. For today is the day, April 21st, 2000 plus 20. And audio and televox networks of the world are at the rocket field to cover the epic event. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is the day, the day we've all been waiting for. In a matter of minutes now, out of that brilliant blue sky will come a ship, a spaceship, carrying in its gleaming hold the first load of uranium taken from the pits of Luna, satellite of Earth. Since the beginning of time... Now, one moment, folks. There's a signal from the tower. This may be it. Take it away, Fred. This is Fred Haskins reporting from the control tower. Our escort planes have been in contact with the spaceship from Luna for the past 12 minutes. Uh, they are now approaching the field from the northeast. At any moment now, we can expect... And there she is! The, the rocket has blown out 17 hours out of Florida City. The magnesium hull white hot from the friction of the atmosphere. Her jet brakes, melting fire. She's, she's right over the field now. She's coming down. Down! Down! Mark well this state, my friends. This is the dawn of the interplanetary age. Earth calling moon. Earth calling moon. I'm in Luna City. 
Luna City, Johnny Dixon. Dixon, where have you been? You're three minutes late. Sorry, McCabe. All shipments as scheduled, everything routine. Report noted. Check out. Check out. You know, Johnny... What, Paul? Sometimes I think we're crazy. <laughs> Spending our lives trooped up in this pressurized shell, breathing synthetic air, risking our necks every time we put on a space suit and go out into the cold, barren, pitted piece of green cheese. Huh. And for what? Who are you kidding, Paul? You know the answer. We're space happy. That's all that's wrong with us. Huh. We pulled every wire and frankly tore the World Federation apart getting this assignment on the moon. And we'll do it again when the first flight into deep space gets underway. Next month, next year, whenever they get through with their preparations. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's it. But right now, Johnny, what I wouldn't give to see a tree again. And cornfields in Kansas. Me, I want to hear a bird sing. And, and watch the lights go on in the skyscrapers along the waterfront. I want to dance with my girl and breathe in the sweet smell of lilac. Boy, if I... Hey, what's that? Huh? That, that, that sound, that vibration. It... There, do you hear it? Well, I... I'm not sure whether I heard or... Or felt it, Johnny. Like a current of air passing by me. Yeah, that's it. Some kind of pulsation. Makes my, my skin tingling. Listen. It sounded different, didn't it? Yeah, a different pitch. The, the instruments are all steady. Nothing on the visit screen. The radar's negative. What is it, Johnny? Where's it from? It's not from Earth, I'll swear to that. I got a crazy notion, Paul. A crazy notion that someone's trying to signal us. You, you mean... I don't know what I mean. Well, maybe McCabe's right. Maybe I gotta touch him. Johnny. Johnny, what is it? Look. Look, Paul. Look at the direction pointer. It swung all the way around. Those sounds, those waves are coming from outer space. I gotta go... Earth calling Luna City. Earth calling Luna City. Luna City to Earth. Go ahead, Earth. Go ahead, McCabe. Dixon, what's going on up there? What's the idea of beaming out those hammy signals? Signals? Yeah, the harpy effect. The music of the sphere stuff. Giving the boys and the monitors down here the hippie-jibbies. You, you got them too, McCabe? You picked them up on Earth? Certainly. What's it all about? The signals, if that's what they are, are coming from one definite spot in outer space. Outer space? That's what I said. Johnny, get your space suit ready. Better have a conference about it. But listen... Have your men tune up rocket 307. Blast off at 0800. We'll be expecting you on Earth in the morning. Ten days now we've been getting those signals, and not one of you geniuses has been able to decipher them. Hey, well, Mr. McCabe, if you know of anyone who can do it better, then Take you Take it better... easy, Professor Wolfson. You don't have to be so touchy. But ten days. What do you say, Dr. Lee? Ten days or ten years, it makes no difference. If those sounds or signals are code, it is in a language unknown to man. You're sure of that? We've consulted the foremost cryptographists of the world. We've tried every way to break the code. What does that add up to? That message, if it is a message, does not come from anywhere on Earth or from any man on Earth. I told you, Chief. It's what I've been saying all along. Of course you can't decode those messages in any known language, living or dead. Because they come from Mars. Mars, I can't be. Be. Yes, Mars. My directional finder on the moon indicated it, and McCabe's down here pinned it down. Look at the graph. I brought it. Uh, directional signals can be wrong. Yes, sir, but get this. I've been timing those signals. They come at intervals of exactly 24 hours, 37 minutes, and 22 seconds. The length of the day on Mars. Yeah. And if we were trying to signal them, we'd do it, say, every night at 1800. That's what they're doing to us. In that case, the next signal is due at... at ten uh, minutes and thirteen seconds. And we'll be sitting here like lummoxes, feeling our scalps tingle while the message drifts past us. Uh, gentlemen, excuse, please. But it seems to me the message need not necessarily drift past us. I know what you mean. By the message, I do not mean the sounds or the words that are being transmitted. I refer to the thoughts themselves. The thoughts that perhaps are being transferred from the Martians to us. Thought transference? What... That's telepathy. We have discarded that word, Mr. Dixon. Too many charlatans use it. But we do know that there is extrasensory perception of thought impulses. Just as there are sound waves which your ear has learned to interpret and light waves which your eye and brain transform into a picture, so there are thought waves, electrical impulses discharged by the brain, which vary with the particular thought. An intriguing idea, Dr. Lee. If only we had some instrument that could pick up and sort out these impulses. There is such an instrument, Professor Wilson. Why, I have been working on it for many years. It involves 
a scanning screen intercepting an electrified field. Well, what are we waiting for? You understand, the telepathator has only been tested for short distances. The signals are reaching us. That's the only important thing, isn't it? How soon can we... The instrument is in the next room. I took the liberty of bringing it with me, hoping it might conceivably be of some use. This way, gentlemen... This little machine can take thoughts and turn them into words we can hear? English words? Not only English, Mr. McKeep. It will translate thought impulses into any language for which you set the dials. You think of something, Mr. Dixon. Now, listen. First, I set for French. Et pardon, les Chinois. German. Wonderful, these are Chinois. And English? Don Clever, these Chinese. <laughs> you must understand... Oh, excuse me, Dr. Lee, but we'll have to postpone this. Fifteen seconds to go. Better set your dials for remote pickup. Stand by, everyone. Nothing. More power. Well, it was a good try. Wait. I've got that feeling again. My, my, my skin's beginning to crawl. Yeah, yeah, mine too. Oh, no, it's just your imagination. Quiet! They are coming through now. Planet four. Greeting, planet three. This is Mars. Mars. The fourth planet from the sun. Greeting, planet three. Planet four calling, planet three. We are trying to reach you, planet three. If you receive our signal, respond. If you receive our signal, respond. We will communicate again. Life on Mars. This week, ladies and gentlemen, the question that has bedeviled mankind ever since the day he first stood erect and gazed into the heavens has been answered. There is life on Mars. Intelligent, articulate life. The country, the world tonight seethes with excitement. Has Mars received our response? Has our telepathator succeeded in projecting as thoughts the messages spoken into it by human beings? Or can it merely receive the thoughts? I'll never get enough of it. Oh, it's lovely, Johnny. And look, there's a moon out tonight. Moon? Oh, please. You know, it's hard to believe that back in 1950, people could still get romantic over that cold, dead, pockmarked, heavenly yo-yo. Oh, now, that red star up there, Mars, that's a different composition. It's alive. There are living beings up there. Johnny, it's staggering. It's, it's beyond imagination. It's Rubbish. Like... Why shouldn't there be life up there? They're so advanced. Spaceships and interplanetary signals. Maybe you've got a point at that. We thought we were so smart because we reached the moon. Our spaceships aren't developed enough yet to get to Mars. It's just as well. What? Because you would want to be the first to go. Wouldn't you like that? Hmm. I'd be quite a hero. You could point at my picture and say, Hey, that's my guy. You're my guy anyway, Johnny. Sure, Terry. But don't worry, honey. I, I won't be seeing any Martians for a long time. All personnel, stand by. Stand by for XM signal. That'll be Mars. Hop to it, Johnny. Telepathator setting, 212 degrees, 18 seconds. Frequency, 600,000. Got that, Johnny? Check. Planet four calling planet three. Planet four calling planet three. We greet you in peace. Your response received. We got through it. The time has come. At this moment, which marks the beginning of the great interstellar age between worlds, it is fitting that there be between us a meeting of minds. Therefore, we are sending a ship to visit your planet. No, I can't be. The ship will depart tonight and enter your magnetic field in seven of our days. Have landing instructions ready. We come in peace. We come.
come in peace. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Matt Wilson bringing you a report of the emergency session of the Federated World Government. Never has an assembly meeting taken place in such an atmosphere of excitement, panic, and recrimination. And here on the I floor of the assembly chamber... We've enough All the emotions aroused by the stunning message from Mars have been boiling and clashing all day. I rise for a point of information. As civilian head of the world military government, I want to know why those Martians have beaten us to the draw. Gentlemen, gentlemen, if the decision we are to make is to be a wise one, we must lay aside passions and fears and consider the question calmly. The Martians are coming, and we must receive them Either with friendship or hostility. Drive them off! Blast them out of the sky! But that may not be as simple as it sounds. Remember, my friends, these Martians are advanced scientifically, perhaps far beyond us. They have conquered deep space. They can transmit thought waves. They may have weapons beside which our nuclear bombs are as toy pistols. Dr. Lee is right, gentlemen. We don't dare fight them off. The risk is too great. They come in peace. They said so over and over again. Let us so receive them. Here, here, here. Very well, very well. If such is the will of this body, let them come in peace. But as civilian head of the world military government, I assure you all, we will not be found napping. Calling Martian Interstellar Ship. Earth calling Martian Interstellar Ship. Here are the landing instructions of the Federated World Government. Three Earth days from this hour, which will be the sixth Martian day of your flight through space, you will be met by an escort of 20 rocket ships. We will greet you in the name of peace. The 20 rocket ships will escort you... Instructions to Commission of Defense. All escort rocket ships assigned to a company Martian spaceship will carry the following armaments. Death fog sprays, magnetic disintegrators, atomic missiles class B. All weapons shall be on the... And upon your entry into the Earth's atmosphere, you will circle our globe once and then make landing at our spaceport at Los Alamos, New Mexico, which will be ready to receive you. The spaceport of Los Alamos shall be mined to a depth of 50 feet with tritonium landmines. The field shall be encircled with radioactive flamethrowers and a reserve force. From the landing field, you will be conducted to the seat of the world government at Washington, D.C., where you will be received and housed in suitable accommodations. We will welcome you in peace. Check out. We will welcome you in peace. We hope. <laughs> Accommodations. Trust McCabe to hand me a crackpot assignment like this. Oh, Johnny, you're the big safe man. You're supposed to know by instinct what's suitable accommodation for a Martian. Don't be silly, Terry. I haven't the slightest notion in the world what they'll look like except some crazy ideas I picked up from science fiction. I don't know why... All right, all right. That's why we're here. The head of our anthropology section has more ideas than any science fiction writer you've ever read. Now, here we are. Ah, Terry, come in. Hello, Professor. Uh, this is Mr. Dixon, the young man I told you about. I know, Mr. Dixon. Uh, professor, I've got a problem. Yeah, yeah, me... Terry and I have discussed the problem. It is my theory that the Martians will, in most important respects, have the characteristics of uh, the Earthman. Oh, what's the basis of your theory, Professor? It's very simple. <clears throat> the accomplishments of the Martians parallel our own. Only a being with opposable thumbs can fashion the intricate devices necessary for spaceships. Only a being with a nervous system like our own could master communication. Only a creature with a brain like ours could dream of peace. Makes sense, Professor. Uh, that's one side of it, Johnny. A lot of other anthropologists think differently. Ah, uh, yeah, that is so. They feel that the Martians living on a dry planet with little vegetation and very little water will be creatures that crawl on the ground like our insects. Enlarged a few thousand times. 
And they look like enormous ants with oversized antennae. All right, Jim. With 48 hours left, I can't prepare accommodations for every conceivable form of life. I just have to improvise after they get here. I just hope they don't get too sick when they first look at us. This is Matt Wilson again, reporting from the spaceport at Los Alamos. A tremendous crowd is gathered here. We're awaiting the appearance of the spaceship from Mars, which is being escorted by 20 rocket ships from the rendezvous near the moon. According to reports, all's gone well so far. The Martian ship... Oh, one moment, please. An audio box announcement is going to be made to the people assembled. Your attention, please. The ship from Mars and its escorts will be seen any moment from the east. You heard that. Any moment, the ship from Mars and... What? There we are! over the field now, casting a huge shadow over the landscape. It's an awe-inspiring spectacle. The ship is tremendous, 18 to 20 stories in height, several city blocks long, and its large windows are fashioned of some kind of transparent metal. Civilian commander to special defense patrol, manned battle stations. Our technical experts are staring at the craft in open mouth wonder. Mr. McCabe, Mr. McCabe, what, what, what is your reaction? I, I am dumbfounded. The ship doesn't seem to operate on a rocket principle. There's, there's no belching fire, no clouds of smoke. I keep wondering what kind of fuel they use, what principles of propulsion, what, what, what metals. Thank you, sir. The ship is almost touching the ground now, and the crowd is getting uneasy. Why, they're, they're falling back, as though, as though there was something. I, I, I see it now. Why, it's a blue haze drifting about the Martian ship, forming a 20-foot blanket of... Whatever it is. Commander, defense patrol. Zero hour. Reorient all weapons. Remove safety controls. Stand by to fire. The Secretary of the World Federation is going to speak. As your great ship settles on our soil, we salute you, the emissaries of space. We wait eagerly for your appearance. Now, the blue mist has completely vanished. All eyes are on the ship, waiting for the first Martian to appear. There is no sign of activity yet. Will you respond to our greetings, Martians? Will you make your presence known? Nothing stirring. No gangplank lowered. No sign of life. Perhaps they were not prepared for atmospheric conditions here. Perhaps on the very brink of success, death has struck within that awe-inspiring vessel. Wait, wait, it looks... Yes, yes, it's moving. A tremendous section of the ship's prow is opening out in front. Like a gigantic tongue, it thrusts forward and drops to earth, forming a great ramp from the ship to our soil. And now it's down, and the surface of the ramp, the surface of the ramp is like nothing ever seen on this earth. A shimmering, impalpable iridescence, unbelievably radiant and beautiful. The throng of spectators is silent, motionless, scarcely breathing, waiting to see the first Martian emerge. And still nothing. No one, no thing comes down the ramp. There is nothing but silence. Listen, that must be the Martian communication vibrations we were told about. Then men on the field are operating the receiving device. Earth men, we ask that you send one representative to board our craft. We assure his safety. What? Gentlemen, gentlemen, there is no cause for alarm. I think there is. They want a hostage or a specimen to take back with them. There's no time for anything. They're waiting for a decision. Mr. Secretary. Yes, Mr. McKee. If it's all right with the committee, I'd like to go aboard. Technical information, sir. No. Quiet, Charlie. This is my dish, McCabe. I was slated for the space run to Mars, remember? They're not doing me out of this. Besides, you're too valuable to waste. Mr. Secretary, tell them I'm coming aboard. Men of Mars, we should fly with your request. Our representative... Is about to board your ship. Get ready, J. 
Johnny Dixon. This is it. Take a good long look at the sun in the sky. Take a deep breath of the earth's good air. You may never get another after you meet whatever is waiting at the end of this long ramp. A ramp? It, it's pulling me forward like a conveyor belt. It's beginning to rise into the air. Get a move on, Johnny. Get into that ship. Get into that ship.
Next week, another exciting drama on 2000 Plus, The Silent Noise. In the year 2000 plus 20, an important man is murdered. How will the police of the future track down a killer? And what new methods of assault will the criminals of tomorrow use? Listen next week and you'll find out. 2000 plus is produced by Sherman H. Dreyer and Robert Winolson. In today's story, Ken Williams played Johnny, Louis Van Ruten played the voice of Mars, Lon Clark played McCabe, Frank Behrens was the senator, Amzie Strickland was Terry, Sanford Bickard was Paul, and Gilbert Mack was Dr. Lee. The orchestra was conducted by Emerson Buckley, music composed by Elliot Jacoby. Script by Judith and David Bublik. Sound by Walt Shaver and Al April. Engineer Bob Albrecht, and your announcer, Ken Marvin. This program was transcribed. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. We now continue with Native American lore at Asaya. According to the Zuni people of southwestern United States, Adasaya is a cannibalistic giant demon. Depicted as several times larger than a human, with his torso described as being as big as a large elk, Adasaya possesses long gray hair as prickly as porcupine quills, skin so thick the knuckles appear horned, muscular arms covered in black and white scales, and a swollen red face in which his bulging eyes never blink. A minority of stories also claim Adesaya has long yellow tusks and long talons. An unsavory figure in native mythology, Adesaya is regarded as an incorrigible liar in addition to being a cannibal of both humans and his fellow demons. Habitually armed, Adesaya is routinely depicted with a giant flint axe or a flint knife as broad as a man's thigh and twice as long. Appearing throughout numerous Zuni legends of similar composition, in Adesaya the Cannibal Demon, the monster deceives two young maidens and lures them back to his lair. After failing to persuade them to eat a soup made from human children or to comb his hair, the women are rescued by the Zuni war gods who slay the demon. In another story, The Rabbit Huntress and Her Adventures, a young woman lost in a blizzard seeks refuge in a cave. Discovered by Anasaya, he attempts to break into the cave but again, the war gods rescue the maiden and defeat the monster. Kamazots, the Death Bat This ferocious creature originates with the ancient Mayans, who depicted him as a powerful god monster from the hellish domain of Zybalba, where he presides over swarms of bloodthirsty vampire bats. Though powerful enough to destroy entire civilizations, Kamazots made a treaty with human beings to bring them fire, but in exchange, he demanded human sacrifices. In other words, there are evil forces lurking everywhere, so you'd better do your homework. The Ogapoga or Nitaka 
The Ogopoga, also known as Nitaka, translated as water demon, is a lake monster who, according to Canadian folklore, lives in Okanagan Lake, British Columbia. Most commonly described as measuring between 40 and 50 feet in length, the sea serpent resembles the extinct Mosasaurus, the carnivorous aquatic lizard from the Cretaceous period. As with the flathead lake monster, numerous sightings of the Ogopoga have been claimed in recent decades, including at Okanagan Mission Beach in 1946 and on film in 1968, although subsequent video analysis proved the creature to have been a mere waterfowl or beaver. According to the legends of the First Nations, the Ogopoga would demand a toll from travelers in exchange for safe passage near its home of Rattlesnake Island in Lake Okanagan, using his tail to create a mighty storm for those who refused and leaving the shoreline strewn with the remains of those who sought to cheat him. The toll required by Ogopoga was that of life, and so when natives ventured into the lake they would often bring small animals, such as chickens, to drown in the lake and appease the monster. In local legend, Tim Baskett, a visiting chief from a neighboring tribe, declared his disbelief in the existence of Ogapoga. Scorning the sacrifices of his guests to the demon, as he returned across Lake Okanagan, Tim Baskett refused and his canoe was sucked under, killing himself and his entire family. Local history also tells of non-Indians who ignored warnings, notably a settler in 1854 called John McDougall. Whilst crossing with a team of horses, McDougall's canoe began to be dragged below the water. Remembering the advice of natives, McDougall cut the ropes holding the horses on board. The horses were pulled under and drowned, but McDougall was spared. Chainu, the Ice Giant Though some tales describe the Chainu as a Bigfoot-like creature, the original legend from the Wabanaki people tells that he was once a human, but at some point committed a horrible crime for which the gods cursed him and turned his heart to ice. His frozen spirit was then trapped within the body of a lumbering, troll-like monster who devours any human he can get his hands on. Mishipeshu, the Water Panther The story of the Water Panther spans multiple tribes, including Cree, Algonquin, Ojibwe, and Shawnee. It's usually described as a giant, dragon-like feline, and the most common element is the monster's aquatic habitat. It lurks in lakes and rivers, waiting for humans to come close to the water, then pulls them under and drowns them. The Kachi Tuwasku, also known as the Stiff-Legged Bear, was an enormous man-eating monster with a large head that allegedly preyed on native people through eastern North America. Approximately the size of an elephant, with the Penobscot Indians of modern-day Maine detailing the creature's inability to sleep lying down due to giant, inflexible legs, it is widely assumed that the monster originated from early mastodon remains, discovered by natives, and incorporated into existing oral histories and mythologies. The Kachituasku serves as a general figure of wider native folklore, with several other tribal cultures retaining belief in a similar monster. The Iroquois people feared the naked bear, as great man-eating creatures with the form of a bear but no fur and an oversized head. The beast was near invincible to ordinary human attacks and could only be wounded in the soles of their feet. Likewise, the Lenape, Shawnee, and Algonquin tribes told legends of the Yakwawiak, gigantic, stiff-legged, hairless bears comparable to mammoths or mastodons, whilst among the tales of the Alabama and Coasati peoples, existed a huge carnivorous predator known as Atipa Tacoba, described as bear-like in appearance. There are very few among those with a love for the supernatural who don't also have a passion for Edgar Allan Poe. Poe wasn't simply a melancholy author who wrote about premature burials, sinister black cats, and talking ravens. He was much more. If you've ever read a modern mystery or horror novel, you can thank Poe. Poe invented the modern mystery story, mostly invented science fiction, and was the first writer to take the horror stories of the Gothic era and set them in modern times, starting a trend that continues today. With a lifelong interest in Poe, 
Troy Taylor decided to take his own look at the mysterious and macabre writer, his tragic life, unexplained death, and lingering hauntings. He invites listeners along to delve into the strange and bizarre world of Edgar Allan Poe, from his early life to his tragic marriage, his insane grief, his dramatically failed career, his links to an unsolved murder, and the mystery of what happened to the writer in the five days before his unexplained death. Even more than a century and a half later, no one knows what happened to Poe before he was found delirious on the streets of Baltimore, Maryland, or what killed him. Why did he disappear and then show up in an incoherent state, wearing another man's clothes? Where did he go when he vanished and who was the mysterious Reynolds that Poe whispered about in his dying breath? And perhaps strangest of all, does he haunt the mysterious graveyard where his body is buried? Nevermore, The Haunted Life and Mysterious Death of Edgar Allan Poe, written by Troy Taylor, narrated by Darren Marlar. Find a link to the book on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. From Hollywood, Tom Neal in The Unexpected. The Unexpected. The Unexpected. Life is filled with the unexpected, happy, romantic, tragic, and mysterious endings to our most ordinary actions. Dreams come true or dreams are shattered by sudden twists of fate in The Unexpected. Who knows what drama may happen tomorrow or an hour from now or in just a moment? Who knows what destiny has in store for the lady down the street, the fellow at the next desk, or you, yourself? Who knows? Listen for just a moment for the unexpected. famous motion picture and stage star in a drama of the unexpected titled Solid Citizen. I was smiling as I walked down Grove Street, saying to myself, Well, Larry Price, you're a solid citizen at last with a good job and a wonderful girl who's going to marry you in a future. Yeah, a future instead of a past. Because that's all over now. All over and forgotten. Then I stopped walking for a moment and felt cold. It was 90 in the shade, but I felt cold. Hello, Mr. Price. What? Oh, hello. Mind if I walk along with you? Free country. Yeah, that's what they say in books. But it ain't always free. Not for some guys, if you know what I mean. No, I don't. Don't you? Who are you, anyway? Steve. You remember me, Mr. Price? Steve. I don't believe so. Funny, I remember you so well. Where? I think it was a cell across from mine. Yeah, you had the cell across from mine. What is it you want? Nothing. What do you want, Mr. Bryant? I don't get you. Well, there's a lot of things you might want. Uh, maybe you want to keep that job you've got down at the filling station. I hear Mr. Arnold is figuring on expanding, setting up another station for you to manage. Uh, maybe you'd want to do that. 
And then there's that pretty little blonde number. What's her name, Helen? Keep her out of this. But you might want to marry Helen. <laughs> I've heard it's on the schedule. You know, there's a lot of things I figured out that you might want to do. All right. So I served time. I served it out, every second of it. It's days done, marked off the calendar. Well, I... I thought you might want to keep them that way. I thought it might be worth about $500 to you to have me leave town tomorrow morning without dropping in to see Miss Helen Page or... Or any of your other new friends. Why, you cheap little... I wouldn't pay you... $500, Mr. Price. I'm staying at the River Arms, fourth floor. I'll be up late. Or until you get there. So long, 11 43 uh, Wasn't that your number? 11 43 He slouched away from me down the street. Just a little guy with a smirk on his cracked lip and a big secret in his head. My secret. But it wasn't mine any longer. I suppose I could have remembered him if I tried. I could remember every ugly detail about those two years in prison. If I tried. And now I had to remember. There'd be no more forgetting. <laughs> Helen would know, too. There wasn't anything I could do about that. Helen would be told. But not by Steve. I'd tell her. No matter how it would tear at her heart, I'd have to tell her. And soon. Very soon. What's the matter, darling? Why the frightened look? Does marriage scare you? You can still back out if you want to. Helen, I want to marry you even more than I want to go on living. Well, what is it then? Some deep, dark secret from your past come back to haunt you? In a way. Oh? Was she blonde or a brunette? Helen, there's something you should know. I won't let you talk about it now. Everybody has secrets, Larry. They're fun and interesting, but not very important. Let's keep our secrets. All right. If that's the way you want it. Sure, Larry. Come on now. Cheer up. And think about the future, darling. And us. I was thinking about the future. About what it would mean to Helen when Riverdale found out she was going to marry an ex-convict. I tried to tell her. Twenty times I tried to tell her. But I couldn't. The words wouldn't push themselves out through my lips. I could imagine the flicker of pain in her eyes. The brave smile that would say, it doesn't make any difference. We'll be married just the same. But it would make a difference. Always. So I couldn't tell Helen about the two years when I was 11, 17, and 43. I had a pass key to the gas station. I jimmied the door to make it look like a burglary. I knew how. Then I went inside and opened the register. The week's total figured just over $500. Nobody saw me at the station. Nobody saw me sneak up the fire escape at the River Arms. But in a way, I almost wished the cops had grabbed me before I could give the money to Steve. 460, 480, 490, 500. Now beat it quick. Get out of town before, before I... Before what? While you can. Why, Mr. Price, I'll be glad to leave. When you've paid me. I've paid you every cent. Five hundred? You misunderstood me. I said fifteen hundred, Mr. Price. Okay, Steve. I understand now. That's fine. I understand that you'll never be paid enough. That's what I wanted to know. Oh? In that case, I'll drop in on Miss Page. I don't think you will, Steve. I don't think you'll do much more talking. You can't scare me with that gun, Price. You're a solid citizen now, and solid citizens don't go around shooting people. They don't have the nerve to pull a trick. Okay, Steve. You win. I haven't got the nerve. I don't want any more memories in the back of my head. You're a coward, Price. You always were. Even in prison, you were a coward. I oh. slapped him. Oh. Hard. Hard as I could. Over and over. Oh. Hoping that my hands dug into his oh. face and smashed blood out of his yellow skin. Oh. He took it without moving until my palms were hot and almost bleeding themselves. Then I clipped him on the chin, picked up the 500, and started back to my room to pack. I didn't care whether Steve told Helen or not. I knew that there couldn't be any future for us, wherever we went, whatever I did or tried to do. Why, Helen, what are you doing here? I, I, I've been waiting for you, Larry. Is something wrong? I've got to talk to you. I, I thought about it you all You mean day. Steve's been here? Steve. 
before. It doesn't matter. Let me talk, Larry. This afternoon, you said something about your past. Your past. And I put you off and tried to make fun out of it. But it isn't fun, Larry. I know. Everything always comes out, no matter how you try to hide it. Sure. So, if you don't already know... Well, it happened when I was just a kid, six years ago. What? Oh, it didn't seem like stealing. The pocketbook was just lying there on the department store counter. I thought someone had lost it, and I told myself I'd turn it in, the lost and found. But... But I didn't. I took it. You kept it. You mean you stole it? Yes, sir. I was a thief. Oh, what? They sent me to reform school for six months. Oh, darling. I, I want you to know, Larry. Well, there's still time. You see, you, you might not want to marry an ex-convict. Oh, you're the only woman I'd ever want. Are you sure, Larry? Of course I'm sure. I want to marry you, Helen, even more than I want to go on living. And I'm going to. Nothing else matters. Not my past nor yours. I'm going to marry you. You think the story is over, don't you? But wait. Fate takes a hand. Wait for the unexpected. for the surprising conclusion to Solid Citizen, starring Tom Neal, written by Robert Libert and Frank Burt, and produced and directed by Frank K. Danzig. Helen and I took the money back to the filling station. Mr. Arnold was there, and I told him the whole story. He just smiled and said the new station would be ready for me to manage when we came back from our honeymoon. Some people are pretty wonderful. And Helen, well, she's the most wonderful of all. After we were married, we never talked about that night. Never. Except once. It was on our first anniversary, just a year later. Larry. Yes, darling? What are you thinking about? Oh, nothing really. Just the past. Our past. It doesn't bother me anymore. It seems kind of unreal and long ago. I remember too, Larry. And I get a little sick feeling down deep inside whenever I think about those awful months in Ashford. Ashford? Yes. At the reform school. Helen, there was no reform school in Ashford six years ago. What? They built it after I got out of prison, I remember. But, 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 Larry, I... Why did you lie to me, Helen? I, uh... Why? All right, Larry, I never stole any money. I never was in reform school. But that day, last year... Yes, Steve did talk to me. He wanted money from me, too. So I knew your secret. And I knew you'd never tell me. I couldn't let you run away, Larry. Back to your old life. I love you too much. So I lied and gave myself a pass that would fit into yours. I wanted to share your life, Larry. All of it. Don't you understand? I understand. I didn't want to build our marriage on a lie. But I had no choice. Some lies are better than the truth, Helen. Sometimes a man needs a woman's lies to make him think he's bigger than he is. To make him the man he wants to be. To make him think he's really worth loving. For always. Solid Citizen, starring Tom Neal, was transcribed in Hollywood. Listen for another exciting story, starring Marsha Hunt, 
who meets the unexpected. This is a Hamilton Whitney radio production, produced under the supervision of Alvin C. Gershenson. I'm a man of habits. Okay, truth be told, my bride says I'm boring. I like the same stuff, and that's what I stick with, and that includes what I eat. Even for breakfast, I used to opt for leftover pizza, hot dogs, hamburgers. Uh, did, did I mention pizza? Anyway, now that I'm trying to lose weight and cut back on the carbs, I've had to make changes for breakfast. Now, instead of a big, heavy breakfast, I just grab one of my Built Bars, the best-tasting protein bar on the planet. Built Bars satisfy my hunger with up to 19 grams of protein and also satisfy my sugar craving, despite being less than 3 grams of sugar. And at only about 150 calories per bar, if I'm really hungry in the morning, I can grab two of them and still feel good about it. Try replacing your dessert, or even a meal like breakfast, with a Built Bar. You won't even know it's not really a candy bar. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built and build a box of your own. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Built, promo code WeirdDarkness. Yidaldushi, the Skinwalker. A skinwalker is a witch who, according to Navajo folklore, has, among other powers, the ability to turn into and disguise themselves as an animal. The animals most commonly associated with skinwalkers are those culturally identified as tricksters, notably the coyote, but can also include those reflective of death and darkness, such as wolves or owls. According to Navajo legend, to become a skinwalker requires the willful murder of a close relative, and as such they are both feared and reviled within native mythology. Representing the antithesis of the supposed cultural ideals of the Navajo and their medicine men, that of healing and helpfulness, skinwalkers choose to instead manipulate spiritual magic to do evil deeds in a perversion against nature. In addition to their powers of physical transformation, Skinwalkers can also possess the bodies of animals and people by locking eyes with them. Due to their presumed power, skinwalkers are prevalent beings in Navajo folktales. These stories typically take the form of climatic struggles between great persons of the tribe and the witch, although atypically for native folklore not always with an exclusively positive outcome, and often included a didactic message for children to learn from. Many victory stories involving skinwalkers conclude with multiple inhabitants of a hogan, the traditional Navajo dwelling, joining together in a communal strength of wills to scare away the monster and the darkness it brings with it. The Kutukamooch, or Ghost Witch One of the scariest figures in the Passamaquoddy and Micmac mythology, the Ghost Witch is often said to be born from the dead body of a shaman who practiced black magic. The demonic entity then emerges each night with murder on its mind. They can be killed with fire, but beware if approaching one. Simply making eye contact or hearing the witch's voice can bring a diabolical curse down on the unwary. The Perverted Merman Dedamkinawet, also known as the Perverted Merman, is a creature which recurrently appears in Algonquin mythology, specifically that of the Abenaki people. Described as half-man and half-fish with a childlike human face, Nadam Kinowet lives in streams and lakes where women regularly wash themselves. 
Unlike other native monsters, Ndamkinowet does not seek to harm these women or to scare them, merely to voyeuristically watch them. Some traditional stories do include attempted molestation, but for the most part, the perverted merman is just that – a pervert. Mermaid-like creatures are a staple within Native American mythology, with several Algonquin tales including characters who disobey their parents being turned into similar creatures. Consistent throughout these depictions in Native legend, the theft of a merman's or mermaid's clothing strips the being of their magical powers and renders them unable to swim. Tataklea, also known as Lakuza, the Owl Women from the Yakama tribe come tales of five supernatural women who resemble giant owls, dwelling in caves by day and flying out at night to prey on all manner of creatures, including humans. In fact, they are said to prefer the taste of children. Legend has it that they can hunt humans by mimicking their language. Tahihan The Tahihan, deriving from the Arapaho word for strong, are a race of cannibalistic dwarves with allegedly superhuman strength. Although descriptions vary, the Taihian are generally depicted as the size of children, with dark skin and said to have an extremely aggressive and unsociable disposition. According to some legends, they possessed the ability to become invisible, while others contend they merely seemed so due to the incredible speed with which they caught their adult prey. Within native folklore, it is widely agreed that the Taihian were destroyed in an ancient conflict in which the Arapahoes and other Native American tribes allied to successfully defeat them. A unique aspect of their characters, it is suggested in some tales that the Taihian had the ability to remove their hearts and store them for safekeeping, in so doing protecting themselves from physical harm to their persons. One such prominent story within Native folklore tells of a warrior captured by a family of Taiyan and who, to delay his death, asks his dim-witted captors about the macabre organs adorning their residence. Upon learning their true nature, the warrior stabs each of the hanging hearts, killing each member of the Taiyan family and winning his freedom. Along with the Taiyan, there are numerous other evil dwarf-like creatures in various indigenous American cultures. The Nimeriger, or People Eaters, are a race of dwarves belonging to Crow and Shozone legend, said to reside in the Wind River and Pedro Mountain ranges of modern-day Wyoming. Described as aggressive by nature, they shoot poisoned arrows and kill their own kind should they fall ill with a blow to the head. During his famed expedition, Meriwether Lewis claimed to have seen evidence of the Devols, describing them as roughly 18 inches tall and highly ferocious. Although originally believed to have been entirely mythical, the 1932 discovery of the San Pedro Mountains mummy, a 14-inch tall mummy, has brought this into question, with tests demonstrating the individual was approximately 65 years old at the time of death and violently killed by an inflicted head wound. Since 1932, several other similar bodies have been recovered across North America, lending credence to a 1778 account suggesting the existence of a pygmy burial ground and the possible historical existence of people akin to the Nemirigar. Not isolated solely to the Nemirigar, Crow folklore also includes the Nerumbi, a race of goblin-like creatures, estimated to be between one and two feet in height with sharp teeth and very little neck, the Nerumbi are considered enemies by the native peoples. Depicted as often engaging themselves in harmless mischief, the Nerumbi are also considered responsible for evil acts such as child abduction and the killing of livestock. Similarly, the Pukwudgies, or Person of the Wilderness, of Algonquin folklore are a knee-high race of little people. Considered by some tribes, including the Ojibwe, to be harmless spirits of the forest, other tribes such as the Abenaki believe the Pukwudgies to be dangerous foes, with a predisposition toward the theft of children and possessing powers similar to those of the magical skinwalkers. Utanka, the Horned Serpent The Horned Serpent, Utanka of the Cherokee people, is a mythological monster that recurs throughout several Native American oral histories, especially in the Great Lakes and southeastern woodlands regions. Described as being as large as a tree trunk and covered in magical scales, 
with horns and a gemstone on its forehead. The horned serpent could not be harmed except in a single spot on its head. Whilst its breath was poisonous, to slay the monster would win the warrior a crystal of immense power, granting a life of successful hunting, rainmaking, and romance. According to Cherokee legend, a great warrior named Agananitsi achieved this feat, wherein he discovered the crystal required a sacrifice of blood each week. Without this tribute, the crystal searches for blood itself, becoming a ball of fire and murdering those it encounters. Other variants of the horned serpent include the tie snake in Muscogee Creek traditions. Slightly smaller than the horned serpent and likewise covered with crystalline scales with a large gem in its forehead, the snake was considered capable of prophecy and its horns were believed to carry medicinal powers. Unlike the Yoktena, the tie snake was not considered to be evil or willfully harmful to humans. Equally, the Alabama people told stories of a crawfish snake of a similar design and purpose. In contrast, traditional Sioux belief claimed these serpents were dangerous water monsters of the ancient world, but had been destroyed by the Thunderbirds, supernatural beings of great power, and only their lesser ancestors, such as lizards and snakes, have survived. It is theorized this mythological belief stemmed from the discovery of dinosaur fossils by the Sioux and the Thunderbirds from pterosaur skeletons. The Flathead Monster The Flathead Lake Monster, which I mentioned very briefly earlier in this episode, originating from Kootenai traditions, is a creature that supposedly dwells in Flathead Lake, Montana. The creature is typically described as an enormous eel-shaped animal with a body akin to that of a snake, measuring between 20 to 40 feet in length, blue-black skin, and gray-black eyes. According to the tribe's legend, the first inhabitants of the region lived on an island in the middle of Flathead Lake. On one winter day, whilst crossing the frozen lake, two girls saw antlers sticking through the ice and, believing they belonged to a drowned animal, decided to cut them off. After cutting into the two-foot-long antlers, the ice split open to reveal the monster, the awakening of whom caused the drowning of half the residents of the lake. This explanation is often provided in folklore for the small number of Kutunai people. Similar to the Loch Ness Monster in Scotland, modern reports of the Flathead Lake Monster are abundant in the local area, including a claim in 1889 by Captain James Kerr, 13 such reports in 1993, and an alleged rescue of a three-year-old drowning boy by the monster. The creature was taken sufficiently seriously that in the 1950s, a significant reward was offered for the capture of this super fish, but despite numerous efforts, no firm evidence of existence has ever been recovered. Two-Face Existing among the Sioux Plains and Omaha tribes, Two-Face, also known as Sharp Elbows, is a two-faced monster who enjoys preying upon native populations, torturing and gruesomely disfiguring his victims before murdering them. As typically depicted in folklore, all who gaze upon either of the twin visages of Two-Face become paralyzed with fear, or in some cases die instantly, and he utilizes his extremely sharp elbows to stab his frozen victims to death. As with several Native American monsters, Two-Face is widely considered to retain a preference for children and female victims, especially pregnant women. According to Lakota mythology, Two-Face was once a woman who was turned into the creature as punishment for attempting to seduce the sun god, with one beautiful face and one hideous. An alternative origin story includes a similar background, albeit with Two-Face being born from such an adulterous woman. This duality, as with several native stories seeking to impart a didactic lesson, is widely regarded as representing a disconnection from and disharmony with nature as an allegorical advocation of traditional conformity within the tribe. Washuga A Washuga, similar but not identical to a Wendigo, is a cannibalistic monster stemming from the stories of the Athabascan people of northwestern Canada. According to legend, the Washuga is a person who has become possessed or overpowered by the spirit of a great animal, in so doing, devolving into a giant, bestial form. Some versions of the Washuga depict the creature as being physically made from ancient ice come to life to hunt humans, 
invulnerable to harm and only defeated when melted over a campfire. This rendition of the Washuga is notably similar to that of the Wabanaki's Chenu, an ice giant who was cursed by the gods for his crimes, his heart turned to ice, and his spirit trapped inside a troll-like monster that feasts upon humans. Described as giant animals, both intelligent and physically powerful, the Washuga hunts humans and attempts to ensnare and devour its prey through cunning deception. As with the Wendigo, certain tribes adhere to a less spiritual origin of the creature, but instead a product of human indulgence in taboos resulting in the physical corruption of the depraved individual. The Dainza of the Peace River region in western Canada, for instance, contend that a Washuga is the product of breaking a strong cultural taboo, such as having a photograph taken with flash, listening to guitar music, or eating meat with fly eggs in it. The Underwater Panthers The Mishibizu, also known as the Underwater Panther or Great Lynx, is a legendary creature belonging to the mythologies of native inhabitants of the Great Lakes region of North America. A monster from the underworld, the panther resides in creeks and rivers, hiding in wait to drown unsuspecting prey. Described by the Sioux as possessing a body shaped like a buffalo, albeit with paws allowing for rapid swimming, the underwater panther has just one eye, horns, either a single horn in the center of its forehead or a pair, dorsal fins, a spiked tail, and is covered in scales. Because of the latter characteristics, it has been speculated that the underwater panther is in fact derived from a prehistoric stegosaurus. Feared by the Ojibwa as the cause of waves, whirlpools, and rapids, it was considered within tribal folklore that each lake might be inhabited by its own underwater panther, which controlled the lake's conditions. Despite being mortal enemies of the Thunderbirds, some native communities revered the creatures as symbols of great power and hunting prowess, whilst at least one tribe fearlessly employed the underwater panther as part of a children's game similar to tag. According to an ancient Chippewa tale, the underwater panther lived on an island of mud situated between two lakeside villages. Avoided by locals for fear of an evil spirit, two girls crossing one day encountered the monster. Cutting off the beast's tail with a wooden oar, the severed limb transformed into a solid piece of copper and became a talisman for good luck in fishing and hunting for their tribe. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. over the minds of mortal men come many shadows, shadows of greed and hate, jealousy and fear. Darkness is the absence of light. So in the sudden shadows which fog the minds of men and women, 
are to be found the strange impulse of which urged them into the unknown. Listen now to Turnabout, tonight's venture in the dark. My motive for killing Marvin Rice was really quite commonplace. Fear, hatred, envy. Now let's skip the motives. The part I find fascinating was the actual crime itself. It was so original. So amazingly clever, if you'll pardon me saying it. There wasn't a flaw in it anywhere. There wasn't the slightest chance in all the world that it would fail. And it didn't fail. Yet downstairs in the prison courtyard, they're testing a gallows built especially for me. As I said, my motive for killing Marvin was in no way unusual. He and I were partners in an exporting business. For a long time, I had helped myself to considerably more than 50% of the profits. When Marvin found it out and added it up, it came to something like $50,000. But I think he was really more shocked at my reasons for taking the money and anything else. You mean you spent all this money on another woman? But what about Ellen? What about her? She's your wife. Oh, don't try to figure it out, Marvin. It's quite complicated. You see, I'm not like you. I can't trot home to my suburban paradise every night to sit by the fireplace in my bedroom slippers and jabber about the petunias. You can. So that makes your Francis luckier than my Ellen. But cheating on your wife, that's the worst part. That's the part I can't forget. No speeches, Marvin, please. I'm not in the mood. Oh, you're not in the mood, eh? In that case, I'm sorry I even brought the matter up. Or perhaps you are in the mood to tell me what you're going to do about this $50,000 shorty. I don't know. I'll think of something. I see. Well, what day is this, Richard? Hmm? May 20th, why? May 20th. I'm circling June 1st on my death calendar. If you haven't replaced the money by then, I'll put you in jail. Jail? You wouldn't do that, Marvin. You want to bet? No. In the meantime, no one will know about the shortage. We'll continue working in the office as we always have. Until the first. Partners to the end. After stealing $50,000, what did you expect me to do, Dick? Offer you my congratulations? As soon as I left Marvin's office, I telephoned the lady I'd spent the money on. She was very understanding. She assured me she'd hock all the things I'd bought her, and she told me to come to her apartment that same evening to pick up the money. When I got to the apartment, I found the only vacancy in the city of Los Angeles. She'd run out, all right. I telephoned Marvin right away. So, she ran out on you, huh? That's too bad. But I've still got June 1st, several of my company. But, Marvin, listen to me. You've got to give me a little more time. June 1st. But I can't... I asked my lawyer just what the penalty in this state was for embezzlement. Do you know it runs as high as ten years? Well, what good would it do you to put me in jail? You still wouldn't have the money? It's not entirely the money, Dave. As I told you before, I can't forgive a man who would steal money to cheat on his wife. But, Marv... June 1st. During the next week, I found that lifting $50,000 is a lot easier than raising $50,000. There wasn't a chance in the world of getting that money. Oh, but I knew when it came to a showdown, Marvin wouldn't send me to prison. You want to bet? Ten years. She wouldn't lock me away for ten years. You want to bet? Ten years. Everything gone. No, I couldn't let him do that to me. You want to bet? I'd kill him first. I'd kill him. Yes, I'd have to kill Marvin. The thought drifted into my mind with the ease of an old friend. I'd have to kill Marvin. There was no other way. But how? Without bringing suspicion on myself. I went downstairs for a cup of coffee and found the answer tacked to a cash register in a little cafe. Now, waiter. Yes, sir? That's fine. If the coffee's weak and the steak is tough, blame Sally. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen anything like that before. That's just a gag the manager cooked up. Figured. The customers blame Sally, they wouldn't pick on us. But what about Sally? She must take a lot of punishment. That's just it. You see, there isn't any Sally. More coffee, sir? I said, more. You said more coffee? No, no, no more coffee. But thanks anyway. Yeah. Thank you very much. And so I found my plan of murder. If the customers blamed Sally, they wouldn't pick on us. And they couldn't pick on Sally if there wasn't any Sally. There was something something else so fascinating about the idea. Marvin Rice, the ideal husband who despised me so for cheating on my wife. Marvin Rice. 
was going to be killed by another woman. <laughs> now, really, wasn't that a perfectly wonderful idea? I went back to the office. It was after closing time, and Marvin was on the 615 Suburban Special headed for Palmdale, his wife, Frances, and the Petunia. The office was empty except for Miss Brown, Marvin's secretary. She was working on some reports. Well, this was as good a time as any to begin. I went into my private office, but I didn't close the door. Without picking up the receiver, I started dialing our own number. I felt like a kid starting a snowball down a hill. Miss Brown didn't hear me dial. But she did hear the phone ring an instant later. I picked up the receiver. I moved my lips as though I were talking. Oh, I hung up. Uh, Miss Brown? Yes, sir? That call was for Mr. Rice. Better tell him about it tomorrow. I'll leave a note on his desk. Right. Who was it? Somebody named Sally. Sally? Yeah, no last name, no middle initial, just Sally. Said she was a friend. I don't know. She sounded kind of mad. After Miss Brown left for the day, I called the Bartlett Hotel. And I reserved a room for the following night in the name of Mr. and Mrs. Marvin Rice. And I told the clerk to be sure to have a good bottle of wine in the room and two glasses. And I called the ticket agency and reserved two seats for the ice volleys for Mr. and Mrs. Marvin Rice. Later, I went to a hock shop in Skid Row and persuaded the kindly clerk to sell me a $20 revolver for a hundred bucks. I was just about all set. The next morning, I got a quick look at Marvin's appointment book and saw he was going to be out from 11 to 1. I went down to the cigar store, closed myself in a telephone booth, and dialed Western Union. Hello, uh, Western Union. I want to send a telegram to Mrs. Marvin Rice, Palmdale, California. Here's a message. Won't be home tonight. Busy with Barnes and E.S. on new catalogs. Call at noon and we'll explain. See you tomorrow, Marvin. Oh, no, make that love, Marvin. Hurry, spell this shop. Uh, this is Marvin Rice calling. Yes, sir. I want you to send a nice orchid corsage to my wife. Send it to the Bartlett Hotel, room 612. God, it's my account. Yes, sir. And enclose this note. To my Sally, without you, life has no meaning. Love, Marvin. I got back to the office a few minutes after 11. Marvin had already gone to his conference when his wife, Frances, called. I took the call. Dinker, I was so surprised when I got the wire this morning. Wire? Yes, from Marvin. Telling me you two would have to work all night on the new catalog. Hmm? My heavens, I didn't think the catalog was coming out for another six months. What is it? Then why work all night? Oh, I'm working on some reports of my own tonight, but I... Oh. Well, Marvin didn't say anything to me about working. But I have the wire right here in my hand. Oh, well, as a matter of fact, Marv told me he was leaving early tonight. Look, as soon as he comes in, I'll have him call you. I'm sure he'll be able to explain everything. Uh, Marvin, your wife called while you were on. Oh? Yeah, her mother's taken ill. Ill? Oh, it's nothing serious. But Frances is going to spend the night with her. Oh, well, I'd better call Frances up and find out what's wrong. Well, you won't be able to reach her. She was just leaving the house with the train when she called. She said for you to stay in town tonight. In town? Mm hmm Where does she think I'm going to get a place in town this late? Well, if you like, I can get a room for you somewhere. Well, uh, okay, you'd better do it. All right. Well, by the way, how's the money-raising situation? Hmm? You know, June 1st is only two days away. Oh, that, yeah. Well, you know, Marvin... You know, I think I figured a way out of that mess. Yeah? Well, for your sake and for Ellen's sake, I hope it works. Thanks. So far, not wood. It's working fine. <laughs> Around four o'clock, I went down to the corner telephone booth and called Marvin's wife again. I told her that he'd called in and said he'd be home for the rest of the day, or rather that he'd been gone on business. I hit that word, business, just right. After that, I found Marvin and told him I'd reserved him a room in the Bartlett, room 612. Then I asked Miss Brown to work overtime with me, and Marvin went over to the hotel. <laughs> he called me the second he got into the room. Hey, this place gives me the creeps. Why? You know what I found over here waiting for me? No, what? An orchid and a chilled bottle of wine. <laughs> Why, my, what'll Francis say? Well, it's not funny. So many things have happened today that don't make sense. Oh, I'm sure there must be a logical explanation for everything. Look, I'll drop over and we'll have a drink of that wine. Maybe we can figure this thing out, huh? I went out to the front office and told Miss Brown to wake me in an hour that I was going to take a snooze. 
Then I locked my office, went out the window, down the fire escape into the alley. It was ten after eight. I had to be back at the desk when she knocked at ten after nine. I made one stop. I bought a sixty-cent tube of lipstick. By the time I got to the bar, but it was fourteen minutes to nine. The lobby was crowded. Nobody would remember me. It was exactly ten minutes to nine when I knocked on Marvin's door. Oh, Judek, come in. Well, the things that have happened tonight, it certainly got me confused. Has it, Marvin? Yes, it... What are you doing with that lipstick? Just decorating a few cigarette stubs. Miss Glant. Huh? Sally has a good taste in lipstick, hasn't she? Sally's? Who? Sally? Stick. Stick that gun. What are you... On my way down the hall, some guy opened his door and asked me if I heard pistol shots. I turned my head and said, yeah, I thought I did. I got back to the office building. It's three minutes after nine. The gun was still in my pocket. I wasn't going to dump it any place where somebody would find it. I got into the basement of our building and ducked the gun behind one of the boilers. There was dust an inch thick on it. No one had been around there in 40 years. I got up to the office at six minutes after nine. I took off my coat. I slumped down on my chair. I felt fine. And four minutes later, Miss Brown remembered me. Hmm? Yeah. Uh. What is it? It's been after nine, Mr. Barnes. So soon, huh? Oh. oh, gosh. Seems like I just closed my eyes. And that's all there was to it. They found Marvin a couple of hours later, and there was a big investigation. But they never found a trace of the person they were looking for, a girl known only as Sally. Created quite a sensation, the sanctimonious Mr. Marvin Rice. Murdered in a love nest. Everyone was so shocked. My wife, Ellen, couldn't get over it. We all pitied poor dear Francis. Now, no one could understand it. But the guy who could understand it least of all was poor Inspector North, who had been assigned to the case. It's driving me nuts, Barnes. Dame doesn't just vanish in a puff of smoke, you know. Still no trace of him. Nothing. I trace back everything Rice did for the whole week up to the murder. Everywhere I turn, I see evidence of Sally. But not one person who ever saw her. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, what are you going to do? What am I going to do? I don't care where I have to go or how long it takes. I'm going to keep looking for it. And I'll find her. You see if I don't. And he did look for quite a while, too. And then he gave it up for fresher, less complicated murders. I became full owner of the company and life was very good. That is until three months ago. That morning, I came down to work, and Miss Brown, who was my secretary now, was waiting for me with a funny look on her face. Mr. Barnes. Yeah? Someone called you last night after you left, and again this morning. Yeah? Who? Well, she... She said her name was Sally, Mr. Barnes. Sally? And that she had to see you sometime today. called? How could she? You're lying. Uh, I'm not lying. Well, why should I lie? How could it be Sally? Don't you think you'd better go to the police, Mr. Barnes? Police? Well, wasn't Sally the name of the girl they think killed Mr. Rice? Yes, yes. But I... Yes. Hey, this is Ellen. What do you want? My goodness, you need to break my head off. I just called about the telegram. The what? The telegram you sent. I got it about an hour ago. I didn't send a telegram. When did you get that telegram? I told you about an hour ago. But you must have sent it there. Your name is on it. I don't care whose name is on it. I'll be home tonight. You understand? I grabbed a taxi and headed for the police department. I felt like a guy in the middle of a nightmare. What was going on? Well, that cop Norse was pretty smart. He'd find out who was behind this. And then it hit me right between the eyes. I couldn't go to the cops. Whoever was doing this knew that I'd killed Marvin. Hey, Cabby, never mind the police station. Take me back to my office. Well, Mr. Barnes, did you go to the police? Huh? Yeah, yeah, they... They said they'll make a complete investigation. She called again while you were gone. Who? Sally. 
What does her voice sound like, Miss Brown? Well, it's... Does it sound like Ellen's or or Mrs. Rice's? No. Why should I... All right, skip it. Any other calls? A couple of business calls and... Oh, yes. The Acme Ticket Agency. Acme Ticket Agency? Yes, they were able to get you two tickets to the Ice Follies. They'll hold them for you until 8 o'clock. That's very kind of them, especially since I didn't order the tickets. Well, then who did? I don't know. I'll get it. Yes. This is the room for the Ice Barnes Hotel. I'd like to speak to Mr. Barnes. Mr. Barnes, what do you want? I just missed to confirm your reservation for tonight, Mr. Barnes. My reservation? Yes, room 612 will be available at your request. 612? But I didn't request anything. I beg your pardon, sir. Wait, wait, yes. It slipped my mind. I'm sorry. Room 612 will be fine. I'll be there tonight. I had to go to the hotel and wait for Sally, whoever Sally turned out to be. Because if I didn't, I'd never be safe again. But when my Sally came to the hotel tonight, she wouldn't find me shivering under the bed. She'd find me waiting with my gun. I went down to the boiler room of the office building and dug it out. Four bullets left. Then I went out and had a couple of drinks. After that, I did a crazy thing. I went to the cemetery where Marvin was buried. He was still there, of course. And I felt like a jerk for even going. I got to the Bartlett Hotel lobby at 7.30 in the evening. The drinks were wearing off. I didn't feel any too good. It is your key to 612. Thanks. Did, did Mrs. Barnes show up yet? No, sir, she hasn't. But we sent the wine up just as you ordered. Wine. Yeah, I kind of expected it would be there. When I got to the room, it really took plenty of courage not to just turn around and start running. But if I did that, I was through. Somebody knew what I'd done. Somebody knew the whole plan. Whoever it was was coming here tonight. Probably to shake me down. I felt the gun in my pocket. There wouldn't be any shakedown. After the bellboy left, I looked around the room. I could feel my whole insides turning around like a washing machine. I saw some cigarette butts in the ashtray. There was lipstick on them. Room clerk. This is the Barnes. Look, you told me no one had been up here in my room. And there hasn't been anybody, sir. Don't lie to me. Who was it? I think your pardon, sir. There's cigarette stubs in the ashtrays. They didn't get there by themselves. No one's been up to your room, sir. The maid must have overlooked the ashtray. You know, it's so hard to get efficient help. I looked at my watch. It was 8.30. If everything went according to schedule, there'd be a knock on the door at 10 to 9, and then I'd know... I held the gun level. Started for the door. But my, my legs weighed a ton. I'm coming, Sally. I'm coming. Well, it's Mrs. Barnes, sir. And the floor is just delivered it, sir. <laughs> Looks like an orchid. It was an orchid, all right, and there was a card in it. And the card read, To my Sally. Without you, life has no meaning. Love. Only this time it was signed. Richard. I felt myself going to pieces. It was almost 20 to 9. Twice I went to the phone to call Detective Norris, but I couldn't go through with it. It would be like sticking my head into a noose. I started drinking the wine. That helped me a little. I broke the gun open. Everything was all right. I looked at my watch again. 15 to 9. I got up and went to the door. I opened it quickly and looked down the hall. The hall was empty. I closed the door. I was trembling like a dried up old man. It was almost time. I took out the gun and put it on the bed. It was 11 minutes to nine. One more minute. If Sally were to arrive on schedule. I picked up the gun. I held it with both hands. And I pointed it to the door. Okay. Okay. You asked for it. I don't know how long I just stood there, looking at the four bullet holes in the closed door. The empty gun was still in my hand. I walked to the door. Who would it be? Okay, Barnes. <laughs> Just hand over the gun. Inspector Norris. That's better. Hey, wait. What? Harry, take the sound of the laboratory right away. Give you any odds you want, it's the gun that killed Marvin Rice. Take your time. It's a gun. I killed him.
That's the whole works, Inspector Morris. It's like every detail. Something for the reformers to worry about, isn't it? The menace of small signs nailed over cash registers. And for that, I'd never thought up Sally. If I hadn't been for Sally, I'd never caught up with you. What are you talking about? There isn't any Sally. Yeah, I know, but it took me some time to realize that. Remember what I told you? Didn't care where I had to go or how long I had to look, I'd find her. Well, I looked so hard, I found you instead. But how did you know about the telegram and the orchid and everything else? It wasn't tough. I told you before, I checked back on everything that had happened to Rice for the whole week. When I realized there wasn't a Sally, I had to find another suspect. I chose you. You turned my own plan against me. That's right. It was a shot in the dark. When you didn't come to me for help after I started things going, I, I knew I hit the jackpot. Oh, one last question, Professor. When did you find out there wasn't any Sally? When I started tracing back in Marvin Rice's life. Mm-hmm. That's where I slipped up, huh? Well, I should have known no one would believe a smug, sanctimonious bore like Marvin could ever have another woman. Oh, but you're wrong there, Mr. Barnes. Hmm? I knew Sally was a fake because during the investigation we discovered the other woman. Her name wasn't Sally and she had a perfect alibi. I'll get you. The other woman's name was Ellen. Your wife, Mr. Barnes. <laughs> That rings down the curtain on Dark Venture featuring Elliot Lewis. Tonight's performance in the Mystery Playhouse. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories used in Weird Darkness, aside from the old-time radio shows, are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio